Uh, welcome everybody to the um, to Vidhi's uh, roundtable on the right against discrimination. Um, we are uh, very happy to have with us uh, a very distinguished set of discussants, um, and I will just introduce them in a bit. But um, to just dive into it, I guess we will just present a little bit on what got us started on this subject matter, why we wanted to study it, how we went about it a little bit, and I think that will maybe set up a little bit. Maybe it's a starting point for our discussion, or at the very least, maybe to provide a little bit of a common language that we can all employ when we are having them. Uh, to everybody who's joining us online, whether on YouTube or Zoom, uh, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you here, and we hope you really enjoy um, what we deliberate today, this Saturday. So, uh, just a quick presentation. Is there enough to do it? Okay. Okay. Um, So the same was my co-author on this. Why is this bar so? Right, so Hussain was my co-author on this report. But, uh, he's studying in Melbourne, he's doing his LLM at this point. So uh, he's going to join us, but he's been ill. Uh, we also were expecting Professor Vidhu Verma from the JNU and um, also Professor Rajiv Bhargav. But Rajiv Bhargav uh, sir has had a little bit of an accident of some sort and Professor Verma is ill. So I'm afraid this is it. Um, Yes, so about this report a little bit and maybe a little bit on how we see the discussion going forward. Uh, the analogy I like to use when we talk about this subject is imagine if you constantly, consistently, when you're walking down the road, walking down the street, walking in your house, climbing the stairs, you find yourself tripping very often. You're not able to um, walk around very well, you, you keep stumbling and uh, not able to walk very well. If this happens consistently over and over again, one of the things you start realizing is that there must be something that's the problem, this is the underlying problem at play. Maybe eyesight's a little weak or there's some anemia, there might be some issue that's there. How can it be that you're constantly tripping? Um, this is similar to what I think has been happening, what we felt was happening when it came to discrimination law in India. How could it be that consistently so many issues, political, social, and I'd say even economic issues in India, came down to this question of identity and how identities like religious identities, caste identities, uh, gender identities were mattering in how people's, the, the outcomes of people's lives were, taking, were, ha were happening. And this list is the list, the list that we have up here is perhaps a little, it's indicative of how extensive this problem is. Um, most recently in 2019, there were protests on the street, people came out on the street with one question in mind, would the question of accelerated naturalization of refugees depend on religious identity? Would it? Should it? This is what people were concerned about centrally. They would use the term secularism, they'd use the term prejudice, they'd use all these kinds of terms, but in, in a very underlying sense, it was about discrimination. Yes, so uh, most recently, uh, uh, we, we did see a bunch of judgments coming from the Supreme Court, which were looking at uh, developing the right against discrimination, specifically in the context of sex discrimination. It started with the Navdeh Johar judgment on 377. Um, it went on with Joseph Shine on a diary. Uh, and then there were judgments on um, opportunities for women in the armed forces, Babita Punia and uh, Nitisha. Uh, and these went some way in giving us a vision of what discrimination law in India can be like. But yet at the same time, we had issues like uh, the CEA protests. We had uh, these kinds of measures being being taken by the uh, by the government and the EWS judgment, the hijab judgment, all indicated that not all judges were on board with this vision that was increasingly developing. The idea that discrimination law was meant to protect people, communities, uh, primarily at least, uh, communities that were um, disadvantaged. Uh, that was the main crux of what that right to be about. So here's just a list of that would be indicative of showing that it's not just a coincidence. There's something really a problem underlying all of these problems, all of these specific issues. So we went about it in by trying to understand what the nature of this issue was. Our sense was people were working on various different fields. Those who were working on sex discrimination, for example, where they really speaking to and relating with those working on caste and reservation, where they where they really speaking to and comprehending what people working on religion and secularism were working on. Uh, where was everyone on the same page? This, the sense that we were getting was that people were not on the same page. Judges were not on the same page. Academicians weren't really maybe speaking to each other. This was our sense. And uh, I want to, of course, point out that nothing in this discussion needs to be centered on the report. 
we just wanted to offer one potential way in which we can look at this problem. Uh, you could, of course, suggest that no people were, in fact, on the same page all along. Um, at the same time, our jurisprudence seemed to be pretty underdeveloped as compared to other jurisdictions. And perhaps most significantly, some of the most serious anxieties we face as a nation today about its identity, about what the future political structure of our country would be like, seem to be about this question. Will religion matter? Will caste matter in a future India? Will it be that individuals will not be able to live the same kinds of lives because of something that they didn't choose or they can't help themselves? And if this really is such a serious anxiety, and some people don't even see this as an anxiety, they are confident that this is what is going to happen. If this is seriously such a big problem, how can we achieve some form of consensus? Or does a consensus not matter? Do, for example, an individual's political opponents and their views, should they not matter at all? Can they be convinced about what everybody should be agreeing on? This is a very, maybe an ambitious hope. But the idea is that it must be attempted. What's the point of a constitution if we can't agree on what it says? So we thought that maybe working on this subject matter will get us a little bit closer to that idea, that we can try and achieve a little bit of a consensus on regardless of where this nation heads, at least we can agree that this should not be the case. So um, we just listed up seven problems that we thought came up and we're just offering it up as something that you use as your common language when discussing this. Uh, we felt the judges were using four different approaches when discussing discrimination law. Um, the first one about an absolute prohibition on discrimination, the idea that race, religion, sex, all of these should not make any difference at all, and they should nobody should be treated differently on those um, those characteristics at all. But this idea is not so much in the judiciary as it might actually be in lay people's minds that a right against discrimination means that you cannot differentiate on the basis of caste, on the basis of religion, etc. Um, on the other hand, there are some um, there are some tests that are using the word only in uh, the right against discrimination in the provisions on this right, uh, which suggests, for example, in the famous case of um, Nargesh Mirza, thank you, sir, uh, where uh, there were two different categories of employees in Air India and um, for men and women, um, air flight nurses and air hostesses, and how they were treated by the employer depended on their gender in a way, depended on their sex. Um, and this was explained away by judges by saying that it was not only sex. That was not the exclusive reason why people have been treated differently. And in fact, there were additional reasons like, very absurdly, the mere fact that those were two separate categories. That was already considered a reason to treat people differently. A very similar case on a basic structure question, there was RC for the earth. A seat in the legislature of Sikkim was reserved for individuals nominated from and belonging to a Buddhist religious institution. So this was, in a sense, a separate electorate in a way. And it was constitutionally required because that was the negotiation with the Kingdom of Sikkim before they joined us. Uh, and the courts agreed that this would be something that was permitted because that institution, that Buddhist institution, was not just a religious institution, but also a social political institution. And this was enough of a reason for judges to think that, no, this doesn't matter. And this is not to say that the outcome of the judgment was wrong. It's just was the reasoning used, was the principle applied the correct one to arrive, to arrive at this conclusion. So uh, similarly, there are tests that seem to treat the right against discrimination as a very light burden to be met. Whereas certain of these new judgments that I mentioned a little back, a little while back, uh, those look at it as a more serious question. Perhaps there's a more strict test to apply. Um, uh, these questions come up in the context of uh, the immunity and deference that is provided to personal laws as well. This also affects the way in which discrimination law has proceeded. Uh, indirect discrimination has been um, accepted by courts, but it has not been applied in judgments uh, subsequently. The hijab judgment being one of them that we really think about. Affirmative action is considered something that can be done by governments, but doesn't have to happen. And so it seems as if our constitutional law actually permits governments to withdraw reservations if they want to. It's, in, it's a question of executive discretion. Um, and then there are a wide variety of issues where various groups are not accounted for in our constitution, non-citizens, persons with disabilities, persons with alternative sexual orientations, gender identities. These are not listed. Our constitution doesn't speak of them explicitly. And so we end up thinking that that doesn't matter. And they are not on the same, they're not on par with the categories that are listed in the constitution. Uh, and finally, we 
face urgent issues about discrimination in the private realm, individuals discriminating against each other. And there are questions that have to be asked about what our constitution has to say about this. Do governments have some duty to intervene when private persons discriminate against each other? So that was our finding on what the problem is. And we'd love to know whether you think this seems on track or whether you think the problem lies somewhere else. We had some ideas about solutions, but we didn't go into that right now because we will hear more about it ourselves right now. I will stop sharing. So, um, our first session, for our first session, we felt that we'd go around the table and hear from everybody a little bit about where they see this problem um, arising from. Where do they see this problem coming from? A little bit about whether you see our diagnosis uh, as somewhere in the same realm as where you see it. Uh, whether you think that there are issues that we haven't talked about, um, what you see as the basic problems, basic principles uh, that should be applied, whether in the political right against discrimination or the legal right against discrimination, where does this come from? How do we, um, how do we, in very simple terms, explain this to those who may not agree with us? How do we try and persuade them that this matters, that this kind of a right matters, and your vision of this right matters? <laughs> Uh, particularly for those who are coming from a legal background, we'd love to hear a little bit about maybe what the test should be. I think if we can lay down our stances about what the test should be, how should a court assess a governmental measure and find out whether it is discriminatory and prohibited or not? Um, there are alternatives that are available, but which is the one that you think would be working out? Um, and finally, do you think that what, what's the precedence, baby? What's the judgment that might matter? Of course, we, we should try our best because we have uh, audience members who are not from audience members and discussants who are not from a legal background. It would be great if we try to bring it onto a more um, uh, accessible uh, language. So, uh, Mr. Kirpal, if I may start with you uh, a little bit on how you see this, just some opening remarks and uh, on the basics. No, I think you're right about the fact that there is a complete discord almost about what the test for anti-discrimination law in India is. You write about these four tests, and it's the courts almost willingly apply a test, sometimes picking the intelligible differentia, sometimes picking up the only test. But that only test, I think, is kind of now consigned with us in a history after the judgment in Nabte Jokar. On that point, has been specifically overruled. But coming back to the issue in a non-legal language, it, what test you employ is very important. Because ultimately, what a test for consideration of an anti-discrimination law will do is fundamentally decide the level of deference that the court will afford to the executive or parliament. It really is ultimately boils down to a question of power. Will the court sustain an act or will it not, depends on how the court views its own role. And that is determined by choosing which test to apply in the first place, right? So half the battle is done when you choose the test. But of course, uh, very often courts work with reverse engineering. And that's something that the Scandinavian legal realists will say, or any practitioner will tell you, is that often a court will come to a decision of what they think to be correct, and they'll retrofit tests, et cetera. And one interesting example of that is I, I, uh, a case recently about subsidies given to uh, people at the time of elections. And there's a Chandu judgment that in the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and he says that, look, this intelligible differential test is awful and it doesn't make any sense and we really need to move on from it. Quotes Tarnam's uh, Ketan's work and says that, but ultimately goes on to apply the same way, the very same test and upholds. The, the law. So I think there is a problem of reverse engineering in this, uh, that the test is determined by the result you want. But coming back again to another question as to this, we this had a discussion at lunch earlier about a universal criticism of a very high degree of deference that is shown by courts to parliament to the use of the twin test of intelligible differentia and rational nexus. So there's an old test of Article 14 that was applied in 1950s in the context of certain set of US judgments that had come on substantive due process 
at the time of the new deal, the idea was that the Article 14 test was to be watered down. It was not really seen as something with political legitimacy almost because it had suffered in the US. So when it came to be applied to India, the judges gave a lot of deference to the executive because of what the history of the same test was across the world. But times have moved on now. We are now 75 years down. And of course, that test, which gave a lot of deference to legislation, then can't be applied now. But the problem is that the judges are bound by precedent. They can't simply tear up a case and say, I don't like it anymore. It's time to change the test. Right? That's not how law works. That's not how legal argumentation works. So in the 70s, of course, they discovered something which is an arbitrariness doctrine in Ruyapa's case and the earlier whole line of cases. And they sidestepped neatly the problem of this twin test by discovering a whole new test of manifest arbitrariness and irrationality, etc. Uh, that has its own problems, how it was applied. We can talk about that, but I must allow other people to speak. But I think a lot of this dichotomy that we have about which test to apply, one or the other, really the, it's down between those two tests. <laughs> And there are, of course, the penumbra around each of those tests, which would vary. But that gets really from the fact that there are two completely inconsistent tests. And I think the latter has been chosen to get out of the problem of precedent. When judges want to strike something down through reverse engineering, the intelligent uh, differential test does not work. They therefore use the manifest arbitrariness test. That seems to be how it's working in practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a lot indeed to say about the arbitrary. I, I can speak for two hours on this, but it's not my conference. It's yeah. a round table conference. And it's very important, sir, that you brought this up because, um, for example, when most people discuss the CAA, uh, the CAA is a stark question <coughs> which really brought up discrimination law for individuals, right down to the uh, right down to the grassroots. Um, it's about non citizens. There are ways in which one can make it about citizens because it is about how you become a citizen. But in a sense, this is the argument of the government it is about non citizens. And the question becomes, is the only test we have in assessing it, what Article 14 offers? Is that all we have? Um, and that question is a little odd because it raises the question, um, is it perfectly fine to engage in sex discrimination against, say, a South African woman? Surely there is something similar in sex discrimination against a South African woman and an Indian woman. If that is so, why can't that be the case for religious discrimination? Uh, and th that's why we need to understand whether the arbitrariness test is going to work out in such situations. But Dr. Sony, uh, please, about your um, a little bit of opening remarks and um, where you see the stance in your stance in this subject matter. I think it's an interesting inflection point because in one way you're looking at the horizontal application of rights now. <clears throat> and you will extend the conversation to the private sector more and more. Just as you gave the example of uh, non-citizens, you're going to have to bring into account now discrimination in the private sector. And I do have comments to make in this specific context of past in the private sector when we go into the next session. You are aware of the California law, for instance, that has been introduced <clears throat> to criminalize past in the US. How ironical is that? But while you're moving uh, laterally and horizontally in those directions, I also think as much as you're inventing new ways to strike down laws, we're also being very literal about our notions of equality. So I don't think the courts are being as trigger happy as uh, you might want to call it on matters of discrimination as they might have been in the recent uh, political history. And that is where I think uh, there are two things that uh, strike out uh, to me. One is the context. This conversation can't be had without a political context, right? Uh, Tala is here, we're doing that hijab case. Uh, unless the context is seen, the very doctrine becomes academic. Now, we argued this, that uh, uh, an upper class Muslim school going, college going girl may actually spurn the idea of hijab herself. But that's not to say that this is a non-issue. You can't use that as an equality doctrine or say Muslim countries worldwide are, are doing away with hijab. Why should we? That's not. I think the test is deeper than that. It's more socio-political. You have to look at ultimately the strata of uh, those being affected by discrimination. 
And I think invariably you will find it is the weaker sections that are receiving, and your list covers many of them. It can be gender, it can be caste, it can be sexuality, it can be religious. But within that, again, you will find strata of those who are less privileged than the others. And if that that context is not borne in mind, we're really not proceeding. That takes me then necessarily to the related question, which is the constitutional morality test. Uh, you're not going to be able to decide these questions or lay down these doctrines unless that is your guiding uh, sort of litmus, right? Otherwise, uh, making everything one is equal. So now one nation, one election, right? <clears throat> and you're going to, you're going to uh, interpret that. Then to mean that it's one, nomenclature is one, therefore it is deemed to be equal. There again, there is a, a discrimination angle that might come in. Apart from the voters and the citizens being affected by it, states could be affected. I don't think we've looked at uh, discrimination law from a federalism state perspective. So yes, I, I only close for now by saying that a lot of this in the current climate uh, has to be regarded from the uh, socio-polity of the time. The context for me is the elephant in the room. I think uh, going forward as well, uh, please feel free, the speakers could feel free to uh, mention what they hear about uh, specific things that they'd like to discuss about uh, what they hear from other speakers. Uh, please feel free to refer to it. We'd like this to be a conversation because that is after all the point of getting everybody here on this table uh, that we exchange notes as best as possible. Um, and if we do not get to an agreement, at least we know where we stand. Uh, so yes, uh, Dr. Arthuri, I want to turn to you now. Um, I think you might have to be leaving us in some time, but uh, we'd really like to hear from you uh, about the basic principles that you think are involved here, some of your remarks on how you think, uh, what you think really matters in this discussion. Thanks so much for the invitation, and I'm really sorry I can't stay for the day. Um, so I, I'm not going to be able to hear what everyone else has to say, but this is shaping up to be an excellent conversation. Um, Thanks for the brief presentation of the report, uh, which is which is really really excellent. Um, and because the discrimination law doctrine is so vast, um, it is really useful in the report as you've done to really break it down into the many things that we have to do to sort of get the doctrine right. Um, because I'm not going to be here all day, I just want to make a brief remark, which might. Um, help zoom out and think about this for the rest of the day and perhaps pick it up later um, so it doesn't become too despairing uh, as to why we don't seem to get the doctrine right. Um, so, so I'll start with the question on what should be our test for discrimination under Article 15. So if you look at the comparative equality law doctrine, it's, it's a really simple test which other countries seem to have adopted, which is three part, um, you ask whether something is based on grounds in either a direct or an indirect sense. Uh, is there a ground implicated on the face of it? Uh, or if there is a disadvantaged group which is suffering, suffering disproportionate impact. Um, here the question is simply about grounds. Do you see a group or a ground involved? Uh, it's a very light touch first stage. Uh, you establish it and you move on pretty quickly to the second stage, which is to establish whether there has been disadvantage or countries call different things differently, discrimination, unfair discrimination. And the third thing is to be able to say whether that disadvantage or discrimination is justified. Um, the All of these um, are, are complicated questions. So right from the word go, we don't seem to have a consensus on which grounds matter and how. Um, and there seems to be even, um, so the, the, the easy way to answer this is just to look at the list of grounds, either in a constitution or a statute and to say these grounds matter. I think from the word go, we, we seem to be losing consensus on which grounds matter. And in India, you can see there's very little consensus left around, say, even caste and religion. So I think we, we, we get into trouble from, from there on. But I think the larger problem is still very much with the second part of the test. How do What do we think discrimination is? What does disadvantage really look like? What are we really trying to address here? And I think the Janhit decision, which was handed down in November 22, is such 
it's it's so telling in terms of what we what we think we're trying to do um and 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 what we think um discrimination law is truly trying to address and to think that um exclusion um from uh from a constitutional amendment which gives reservation to economically weaker sex sections um uh, could 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 exclude um constitutionally recognized categories of SCST and OBCs, the fact that we think that 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 is acceptable makes you think more fundamentally about the political consensus around this. And I think we're losing the political consensus um, uh, in, in, say, the sort of 50 year old history of discrimination law. It's literally the the same 50 year old history that you that you look at from across the world, whether we, we we're thinking uh, from the start of say how the discrimination law came to be shaped by Title VII after the Civil Rights Act in the U.S. and then really sort of proliferated in the in the syntax of discrimination law, right? So our constitution is of course older than Title VII, but of course the U.S. Constitution is older than our constitution. So why do we think that the discrimination law as a field is 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 not more than a couple of decades ago? Because I think. The syntax that we use in terms of grounds, disadvantage, justification, that's pretty much what comparative equality law has developed. Judges having conversation with each other across different um, jurisdictions and then coming up with what we think is the, the shared vocabulary. And I think that shared vocabulary really relied on local regional context um, and, and then sort of got built up into this shared vocabulary. It wasn't that it was top down. Um, and I think that the, the political consensus for that is, is fraud. Um, I want to I wanted to say something and, and then leave it at that and perhaps you, you'll have a moment in the day to pick it up from there. I think there's something, I think it, it, I won't be so despairing because I think this might just be a moment for us to think about whether what we have developed in the last couple of decades is fit for purpose here. And you can see where the US has gone. You can see the South African equality law, sort of people who sort of led us in terms of thinking more about equality and non-discrimination, the doctrine of it seem to be flailing themselves. And I think the reason might be that the structure, the edifice of discrimination law that we have may not be fit for purpose. And I say that because the structure really developed not in, in any other sense. It, it's not a civil law statutory structure. We do have constitutional guarantees and statutes, but the way in which equality discrimination law has developed is really in the taught law model, the common law model of judges getting the moment to say something about discrimination and develop a test and then apply. Um, and then in, in, in the classic Dokin, Dokin in way, you're thinking about a Herculean uh, judge and a chain novel where one judge gets to do a discrimination judgment, the other judge picks up from that, discerns a principle, applies that principle, but develops it further, and the chain goes on and on and on. That's the classic common law, taught law model of development of things. Except the problem with that model is that it's individual oriented. So the kind of things that you end up addressing there is that one victim comes to the court or a group comes to the court and asks for exposed remedies. So something has already happened. Discrimination has already happened. It's wrong. And then we're trying to remedy it um, after the fact of it ha happening. And I think the worry with what we call the liberal model of discrimination is that it's evading the more structural issues. So if you think of our understanding of, oh, what is race discrimination? It seems really divorced from what we think is the problem, which is structural, which is racism or casteism, right? So the structural issues around what, what is the edifice of racism? What, what is so structural about it? And the fact that it's not an individual problem, it's not a he said, she said, somebody being bad to somebody. Um, we, see, we don't seem to have a template of remedying that in the liberal model of discrimination that we have. And you can see that across the world. Um, the only non-liberal models that we seem to have are the limited sort of reservation uh, affirmative action type provisions, which too um, do, do, do little in actually addressing the disadvantage or discrimination at a structural point. So I, th I think what I would leave you with is to just think deeply about 
what what may be problematic about trying to treat discrimination exposed and in the liberal frame where the victim or the atom that you're concerned with is actually an individual rather than group based structural disadvantage uh, and perhaps take this moment um, to not just say why are we not getting where you know other countries maybe in terms of doctrine but to say why even they may be struggling with the current mode of thinking that we have as discrimination lawyers thank you so much and have a good rest of the day i'll stay on to hear a bit um but i'll i'll, I'll, I'll leave you at that thank you thank you so much dr i think that actually gives a lot of uh, insight about how we could be thinking about this problem um often when we think about it in a very legal sense we miss out on some of the the why questions what's the point of article 15 why do we even have it what were they thinking when they put it in there what were they afraid of what should we think it should be doing now uh so dr athi thank you so much once again for that um uh mr babu that actually gives us a good segue uh, to put this a little bit more in a broader non legal context as well um how do you see this working out in politics let me start with a confession that uh, i did a scar here yeah uh, just, just, uh, just to be clear i hope you are audible yeah uh, if it's not audible anybody who's online please let us know at any uh, point i would just request uh, can you hear me if you i would request to face the screen when you're speaking the audibility improves dramatically if you face towards the other side okay, we okay, okay that's the only request thank you thank you alok um uh, when i think of discrimination or anti discrimination uh, provisions in the constitution what i think is the elephant in the room is we have a we had a significant section of very influential uh, groups in india which never accepted constitution not just constitution of india ipc crpc indian evidence act from 1860s onwards i would go back even 1835 the year british amended the penal laws to say that the brahmins would be subject to capital punishment for the same crime they had that uh, exemption at that time you know what groups are talking about in 1950 within one week after constitution came into being you have editorial from rss organization saying that we will never accept constitution from india well 75 years ago would i say it's past no need to talk about no it's not past the same groups which have not accepted the constitution of india because it insists on individual rights their argument is no we are not a western society based on individual rights we are a group society where you have to take all our culture and religious traditions into account so we can't treat individuals as individuals we only treat them according to their social identities mm -hmm. so that group has the primacy now not just in media in politics in, you see that every walk of life so that is reflecting more and more in the way laws are being made and very soon the way they are going to be interpreted you know in the past few decades not just since uh, 2014 and not that everything started after that only for the past few decades we figured out a trick which is no matter what your formal laws says you don't need to change them but to do what you want that can be the heaviest law the uh, heaviest corpus uh, litigation or anything a judge of the supreme court or the chief justice pull yesterday <laughs> talks about how absurd a particular uh, litigation against to uh, editors guild of india he had all the power to just simply smash it he gives enough time to the state to come back with so many other things i can give on this kind of anecdotal uh, examples more and more but for me this is a central problem from there you have all these litigations confusing laws and confusing judgments that are coming that significant group you know and there was some constitution happening in the west but entire society basically accepts the essence of a constitution because a particular generation in their enlightened view qualified it interpretations can vary but we have a situation in india a significant section at one time now it is a predominantly 
majority uh, segments in your politics, in your media, in your bureaucracy, I would say even in your uh, judicial uh, system, they don't believe that individual rights. How do we do that? So that's my real problem. Thank you so much, Mr. Nardu. That That's quite sobering, really. Uh, and I think it really, um, once again, it, as we, as we were expecting from you, you put it down uh, in a way that makes us look away from the law a little bit and see what's really happening. Um, so, uh, Mr. Devan, would you like to uh, speak about how you see this, how you see this discussion going forward? What you see your, uh, what you see about the basics on this? Thank you, Nardu. So where, uh, from where I see it, and something that uh, I worked I had to assess, so in the hijab matter. See, the hijab matter, for example, started from an administrative law instrument. It was not a legislation. So uh, once, whenever we are looking at legislation, we are looking at you know legislation at a very very higher up. So CA may be a legislation, but there is everyday discrimination that is happening at ad administrative law level right? by means of administrative instruments so um and that needs to be dealt with within the principles of administrative law read with um, the constitutional mm -hmm. values that we have so i mean it was very it was i mean in the first place such an administrative law instrument impinging upon individual rights should not have been permitted that was the first line of argument um so that that's something that you know that that's where the problem starts i mean and um if even an example, I'm going to give another example of where uh, the administration uh, does not regard the individual rights or the way in which the law is supposed to work. Um, in Delhi, uh, there was a petition that was filed in the High Court complaining that um, when Muslims want to register their marriages, uh, they are invariably sent towards the Special Marriage Act process of registration of marriage. Whereas if Hindus want to register their marriage, they can do it under the rules framed under the Hindu Marriage Act. Now that's a problem because under the Special Marriage Act, once a marriage is registered under the Special Marriage Act, the effect is that the Sharia law or the personal law of the person will um, stop applying. Now that may not be a conscious choice. I mean, I can understand that some people may want to make a conscious choice of not following their personal law. Um, same as probably in hijab example that's already given that certain people may not want to do what um, others want to do. But here is a case where you want to register your marriage and simply because you want to avail of all the benefits that come with the registration of marriage. And then there is no secular law that is available. So in specific to Delhi, there was an executive order that had been issued, um, which provided for registration of all forms of marriages within uh, solemnized within Delhi. So irrespective of whether it's another form of marriage, for example, a Sharia marriage or a Muslim uh, law marriage, it could be registered under that executive order. But there is no system that is available really to, um, uh, to exercise that option. Now, that's a discrimination because the one, the effect of registration to the process of registration. Now, if you want to register a marriage under the Special Marriage Act, it takes minimum 30 days, takes three witnesses, which is not the process of marriage registration that is available for uh, Hindus because you can register in half a day. So, you know, it creates its own administrative law issues and... Um, arising purely because of the way administration understands uh, rights or uh, I should say fails to understand. And that is where um, the, the test of empathy or you know the individual dignity has to come in. And um, as Dr. Sodhi pointed out, um, you have to look at the problem from the perspective of those who feel discriminated and then try to understand and apply the test rather than uh, the test being devised and then sought to be applied across the board, uh, you cannot simply ignore the perspective of those who feel discriminated. Um, I also feel that very often uh, when you mount a challenge on uh, the ground of discrimination, and I'm not you know, referring to any religious or caste discrimination, but generally saying, you know, classification or discrimination in that sense, you know, one class of people versus another class of people. And that's the language that we confront with the court every day. Very often the court throws a question as well. This is a policy choice that the government has make, made. So the difference between what is the legal implication of a broad policy decision, when does a policy decision and how does it become a legal uh, discriminatory text? That is something very important. And I think that's, that also needs to be addressed. 
because government may make a policy choice government may want to do a policy choice but how in law that policy has to be implemented again using hijab as an example all right assuming for a moment that it's a valid choice you want to restrict certain people from wearing hijab but you can't do it by way of an administrative law instrument it has to be done by a law now so but that's uh, so that's something that has to be also thought through because you know in the courts you know government wants to do it why can't they do it i mean of course they want to do it they there's a mechanism for doing it compel them to do it now that's where the tolerance on the part of the court or you know that deference to the executive also comes in no no they want to do it they can do it whichever way they like how does it really matter you know that's the that's the problem that all of us um begin to tolerate these small incidents of discrimination at every level and that sort of breeds a culture of um, illegality in the government and which stops as uh, professor uh, babu pointed out stops you know really caring the one thing could be there in the text one thing could be in the judgment ideally that we all respect and venerate but and another thing happening on the ground so that disconnect is something that we try to bridge and as practitioners we i mean that's our uh, uh, that's our job to do it but you know the, the really i mean how, how many battles can you know we fight Thank you, thank you so much, Singh. Uh, Tulsi, uh, there was just this. I'm getting this sense that uh, at, on the one hand we have um, stalwarts of the law, we have uh, you know serious questions about how the law should be built up, and there is this serious pessimism as well that we can see about what's the point of the law if it's not managing to do work it's supposed to. Uh, how do you see this coming forward? You you worked on a case on sex discrimination. Uh, how do you see the basics of this playing out? It's quite interesting because I see, as rightly sort of indicated by Shambhav, I think there is a very interesting contrast uh, with respect to what's happening in terms of discrimination law and discrimination, uh, what, uh, what is happening in terms of discrimination in politics. So I think on the one hand, um, as, far as, anti, as far as lawyers are concerned who are working on anti-discrimination law like myself, I think this is a fantastic time for lawyers in India who are who specialized in this field, particularly because you can see the field growing. You can see that from sort of a very stagnant um, test that was once there, which is like the, the which is the twin test, which is still selling to the and rational nexus. You see the discrimination law in India growing and picking up various tools from various corners. So you see that judges and scholars are generally picking up the, the, the idea of indirect discrimination and, and you see a case developing through Kennel Beach and how the doctrine is evolving. You see that a lot of drums developing through uh, the great joker and you see that you can you see you see that discrimination lawyers are trying to look at what is the commonality between the grounds of caste uh, religion or, or place of birth and what what unifies them and, and actually looking at looking at factors which unify them. And you see there's, there's this beautiful expansion of, of a jurisprudence, if you will, on the one hand. And on the other, if, if you just look at politics and how the state is interacting with its, in, uh, with its citizens and individuals broadly, I think there is a, there is a great gap because the, the state who actually wants to discriminate and who continuously discriminates among a variety of instruments so be the legislation in NCAA, which, uh, which in my view at least is, is, is plainly discriminatory with respect to denying a basic good of citizenship to one class, uh, one class of persons, or be it any other aspect such as uh, such as uh, the hijab case, which was just brought in in terms of just uh, saying that you simply cannot wear what you what you want to wear, and and. and we will not really consider whether that's a requirement of your religion or whether whether you're required by your religion or it, 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 whether it's a matter of religious choice for you to wear the hijab. We will not consider any of these aspects and we will just uh, impose on you what, what the majority thinks to be right. So I think that there that is a that's a great contrast, which I see in, in uh, contemporary India, and that that I think is, is, is worth pointing out. And the challenge I think is with all the doctrines that we have. And with all the tools that we have developed in anti-discrimination law, how do we deal with this culture of discrimination that has now emerged? The culture is very, very strongly coming from the majoritarian government, from the center, and its, its allies or, or other uh, supplementary institutions and supplementary mechanisms that we have. But that, uh, that um, leaving that uh, there, I just want to come back to, and of course, give 
a third opening remarks with respect to the basics on our discrimination law and something that might help us to take the discussion forward at least in, in theory. So I think as, as Dr. Adve was uh, correctly pointing out, the general jurisprudence on discrimination, especially for the benefit of non-lawyers, we have been focused on these two aspects broadly. The first has been that traditionally or conventionally there have been certain identified grounds of discrimination. So we have noted that there have been instances of discrimination based on caste, discrimination based on religion, discrimination based on race of birth. And what unifies all these aspects is at least one of the aspects which unifies these uh, these criteria is that there, on all these limits, there have been systemic discrimination. Which takes me to the second uh, aspect or the second uh, ingredient of discrimination law, which uh, usually liberal democracies address, which is the, uh, that this particular group that you're talking about has suffered a systemic, systemic disadvantage. So many jurisdictions look at two groups broadly, and of course, there are scholars who disagree on this. Uh, but, but one understanding is, of course, that there is a dominant group and there is a cognate group, and there is a history of the dominant group discriminating against the cognate group. And because of this history and because of the systemic nature, because of the depth of the discrimination, because of the extent of this discrimination that we have in the society, there is a need to protect one group against the other. There's a need to protect people who belong to a particular uh, religious community because on the basis of that particular religious identity, they have been discriminated over time. And so on and so forth. And same in the, in the, in the aspect of uh, caste and similar in the aspect of um, sex as well. So I think the, the, we, when, whenever we talk about uh, what is meant by discrimination, these two aspects come into play and we usually play with these, these tools which become sort of necessary uh, when we talk about discrimination. And very interestingly, in the Indian context, I think tra the traditional test of, of the rational nexus or even the manifest Aboriginal test, for example, don't really map on to these, these two aspects. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because Again, one of one of the countries which have had a relatively, uh, I think, late constitution in the uh, in the nineteen forties, and the the doctrines that were developed don't really match on with the academic discourse on on discrimination. At least until now, at least until, until twenty eighteen, with Nampet and Joseph trying to students coming in, I think it's sort of now able to reach some sort of a familiarity, able to reach some sort of a, of a comfort with what uh, modern jurisdictions across the world are speaking about when they talk about discrimination law. But very interestingly, manifest establishment is, is a very different kind of test. The quality of this is very different. If you just look at an administrative action, you can argue that an, an administrative order which simply does not give reasons as to why it has reached a particular conclusion is manifestly arbitrary. And that's, that has nothing to do with groups, that has nothing to do with any discussion on government or government groups, that has nothing to do with systemic disadvantage. So that that's also I think, an interesting contrast that we can, or an interesting feature of Indian discrimination law that we can uh, probably point out. And I think there are other problems with discrimination law generally, uh, such as there is a lack of focus on some aspects of uh, discrimination and there is a very great emphasis on some other aspects. So for example, if you, if you look at the entire jurisprudence on anti-discrimination law in India, you see that there's a great emphasis on reservation law. The law of reservations have, I think, dominated the discourse on equality and, and anti-discrimination to such an extent that it has made various other aspects of anti-discrimination the obsolete or sort of irrelevant. And that, and, that, and that is quite problematic. If you look at some aspects which have been completely under-addressed in, in, in the discrimination law, it is aspects like private discrimination. It is aspects like, or it, it's the reality that in various metro cities in India, Muslims find it extremely difficult to find a private housing and the aspect of private discrimination, broadly speaking, do not find a place. We don't even really discuss about it when we talk about discrimination law or when we seriously deliberate on anti-discrimination law. And I think that is problematic. That's problematic because the extent of discrimination in India, contrary to our understanding, is not only sort of, you know, inscribed by the state or imposed by the state. A lot of discrimination in India, a lot of problematic discrimination in the country, is initiated by private actors in private spaces or in so-called private spaces in terms of employer-employee relationship, in terms of landlord-tenant relationship. And the entire discussion on this gets, I think, sidelined because of the focus on certain other aspects such as reservation, which we, I think, which, which we need to sort of <laughs> come back from and we need to uh, counterbalance this. 
this approach that we have been uh, having. But yeah, that would be uh, that would conclude. I see my opening remarks, and I hope to take. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I hope. I mean, this gives a little bit of an uh, of a clue as to some of those more modern tools that address some of those questions of pessimism that we were feeling. Uh, we don't have them ingrained in Indian law right now. But these are some of the ways in which people have been speaking about this subject in other countries. And these are things that people have realized after working discrimination law over decades. They figured out that, yes, maybe this is a different point that we originally did not understand, but now we must accept as part of what discrimination law is. Um, Dr. Stewart, do you want to uh, chip in about your... Sure. Um, so I'll try to... Sorry, uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, so I think uh, I want to start with sort of one preface that um, what I find quite remarkable about these discussions is um, uh, you have lawyers kind of very hopefully talking about discrimination or inequality in India. And at the same time, if you look outside India, it's likely the most unequal society on earth. So if you look at economic inequality, the measures are about as unequal as Brazil or South Africa. Um, it's one of the most sexist societies on earth. Um, it's one of the societies that is marred by religious majoritarianism and fears of religious minorities. Um, it's regionally very unequal. So it's effectively a sea of Sub-Saharan Africa with some islands of California sprinkled in between. Um, they are currently one, one of these islands here. Um, and on top of all of that, you have a caste system um, that intersects and reinforces all of that. So they have a kind of huge, um, really big paradox of um, this vast amount of inequality. And then you have lawyers trying to do something um, with respect to equality and national discrimination provisions. And so I think I want to pick up on one thing that uh, sort of Kiffer mentioned on sort of retrofitting um, kind of reasoning. And I think that applies not just to judges, um, as you mentioned, but I think it also applies to litigants and, and academic lawyers that try to retrofit a lot of these equality concerns into existing laws and try to see how far law can be pushed in order to address these things. And I think that's a very um, valuable and important impulse, but there are very important limitations to that. And I think those are limitations that we, uh, that we, need, to, uh, that we need to acknowledge. So private discrimination, as, as Tulsi has mentioned, is one of these examples where the provisions in the constitution are fairly limited. And you can try to push them and you can try to um, state that they should be used more and that's perfectly fine. But even if we did that, there's still a huge way to go. And so I think there are kind of two senses in which we might be expecting too much, and this might contribute to some of the things that Lalit mentioned in terms of the confusions about, um, about anti-discrimination law. And I think one is we expect too much out of the constitutional provisions. Um, so most countries in the world have a variety of anti-discrimination laws. The US has the Civil Rights Act, they have the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's all sorts of legislations that really uh, try to tackle it. India has well, arguably the SCSD Atrocities Act, but that's a criminal law. It's not a genuine anti-discrimination law, and it has very little value of legislation. So there's one sense in which um, perhaps you might just, some of the questions that I mentioned, legislation might be the best way to go, but it's very difficult even for states, um, even progressive states in India have not enacted anti-discrimination laws. In and then the second one, which goes, I think, back to the base point on the sort of structural ideas of discrimination, um, is that we might be expecting law and legal regulations to do too much. Um, so to really address issues of, say, past um, or say gender, we need a lot more than just tinkering with legal frameworks. We need a lot more social policy interventions that, uh, that are tuned um, in this form. So I think we should keep in mind that while legal frameworks are important and we should think carefully about how to improve them, that we shouldn't be expecting too much from them and uh, keep in mind the sort of role that they can play and that they have to play um, in, in consonance with other measures that we, that we have to take in some form. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Pillai, can we, uh, would you like to speak on this, uh, on the your opening remarks and on the basic principles? Um, sure, of course. Uh, thank you, Lalit, and um, thanks to everyone at Vidhi for uh, for this invite. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to everyone else's uh, opening comments, um, and I agree with uh, Dr. Stewart on <laughs> on tempering our expectations from the law and constitutionalism, but at the same time, not 
uh, refraining from seeing how we can really push the boundaries of both law and constitutionalism. So in that spirit, um, I think we would all agree that um, there is no unifying principle underlying discrimination law in India. Your report shows that and anyone who's practiced in it or reads it or works on it uh, would agree with that. So um, so to, uh, to maybe propose something as, as a unifying principle um, or an idea of what could be rather than what it already is, because there is no consensus on what already is. So this idea, of course, has been picked up both by Tulsi in her opening remarks and by Shreya. And it's this idea of disadvantage and the role of discrimination law as being to redress disadvantage of historically disadvantaged groups of citizens, right? And both Tulsi and Shreya have actually given us I think, a reason for why that should be the frame from the lens of comparative law. So they have said that um, several comparative jurisdictions from which India draws on and which also engage with, with India uh, in their own jurisprudence rely on disadvantage as that central organizing principle to understand discrimination law. Uh, of course, there are contestations around what disadvantage means and how disadvantage should not be understood as uh, single dimensionally to mean maybe just sort of stigma stereotypes or to mean simply individualistic forms of disadvantage, but rather extended also to structural forms, etc. But again, uh, the, the core idea being that it is about discrimination or what it tries to do is to redress disadvantage. Uh, there, there could be normative reasons, I think, for why disadvantage is the best principle or the most helpful principle for discrimination law to organize around compared to other competing principles like, say, liberty or freedom or dignity or welfare. Um, some might argue the disadvantage could be, I mean, of course, all, all of these principles have our concepts and then you can develop conceptions which accommodate other conceptions. So some might say that freedom fits into disadvantage or dignity fits into disadvantage and vice versa. But the case I want to make for disadvantage is much more instrumental. It is to say that um, this, if we were to see the purpose of discrimination law as being about addressing multidimensional forms of disadvantage, it would address some of the problems that you point out in your a report. So it has an instrumental purpose, if that is, it helps us overcome instrumentally some of the uh, mm, ruts that discrimination law in India has fallen into. So I'll pick up a few. One is, of course, um, this distinction between discrimination law being symmetric, which is any form of treatment on prohibited grounds becomes uh, discriminatory. In the US, this is often called race, um, quote unquote, blindness or color blindness. Um, and if we were to reorganize discrimination law around the principle of disadvantage, we would automatically move away from a symmetric understanding to an asymmetric understanding, uh, which is one of the problems that your report highlights, the problems with a symmetric understanding or the problems with simply treating all groups in exactly the same way. So, um, so we shift from symmetricity to asymmetricity if we were to change our organizing principle. Another shift that would automatically come about is a shift from intention to impact, because if we are concerned about addressing disadvantage, then the intention behind the law that has the effect of perpetuating disadvantage would become irrelevant uh, or become less relevant within the entire scheme of discrimination law. So that shift becomes facilitated if we change what's at the root of discrimination law. A third example would be affirmative action, a reservation that um, the report shows quite clearly how it is not yet um, constructed as a duty on the state, but simply a form of discretionary measure the state can take. But once again, if we consider the purpose of discrimination law as redressing disadvantage, then we automatically understand that to redress disadvantage, sometimes it is important to treat groups differently, which then implies a duty to um, undertake measures of reservation. As Shreya was saying, reservation is, of course, just a very small fix um, to the problems that we have. But, but in any case, I think building up the framework to require a duty of imposing reservation is much further down the line than where we are currently. And the last example of what might change is and the report too highlights this about certain grounds like religion, uh, which are different from other grounds like caste. So the purpose of uh, 
the purpose of discrimination law in respect to caste might be to eradicate caste in certain ways, while with respect to religion, it is about it's not just about removing religious differences because religion, there is that aspect of, you know, group identity uh, and the construction of individual identity through that. Um, so there is something about religious differences that has to be celebrated. Um, so if we see discrimination laws simply eliminating difference, that whole thing gets wiped out. Uh, but if we see discrimination laws not eliminating difference, but as redressing disadvantage, we are still able to preserve and celebrate difference while removing disadvantage associated with difference. So we remove disadvantage associated with religious identities, but we still preserve the right of people belonging to di different religions to um, exercise their identity in different forms. So um, these are just four examples uh, drawing on your report of where a shift in the, the foundation of discrimination law could instrumentally translate into uh, changing its architecture. I'll stop here. I'm sure we'll discuss some of this later. Um, but I wanted to put this on the table as um, an idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was actually very helpful. It, it does put a lot of things on the table that we will be using. We should be using at least as we go forward. Um, Rubai, if I may, um, she's mentioned a little bit about how um, we can change the language of discrimination as we talk about it in constitutional law in India today. And she mentioned a little bit also about how different grounds are treated differently. You've worked on multiple, uh, on, on issues related to multiple grounds as well, in a way. Um, uh, and you could also give us what, what you think about it. And if it's possible to carry that forward, but it's about your opening remarks. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think Gauri has given us a very well-framed formulation that as a practitioner, I would hope we would be able to use. But uh, I think the, the problems highlighted by Professor Babu especially um, uh, are an initial barrier, which is that I don't think we have a consensus. I think Shreya used the word political consensus. We don't have a consensus on, uh, on an understanding of disadvantage or asymmetry. And so some groups, for example, uh, around the Muslim identity or around certain class identities or class experiences of disadvantage, we don't have an actual consensus that this disadvantage is going to be recognized and is going to be remedied. Um, we, don't, we don't have it politically, we don't necessarily have it in the law, we have it in some ways in the law. And um, this becomes problematic because when you're identifying an experience of disadvantage and you want to translate that into an actual legal challenge, you're often faced with intersectionality, which is difficult to construct legally. Uh, and then proving disadvantage has become very challenging. So for citizenship, for example, you're dealing with a group uh, of people who are disadvantaged because of an intersection of their religious, class, linguistic identity, because of their uh, historical experience of migration for different reasons. Uh, and added to that would be gender, uh, being excluded from formal education, uh, child marriage, all of you're trying to capture all of those aspects that come together to create this disadvantaged experience. And um, when we're trying to do that and try to make a case for disadvantage, uh, you know, the kind of challenges we've had are how do we show this? What data, what kind of parameters uh, do we show? How do we represent ethnographic uh, research? Um, and how do we capture recognition and dignity-based harms in uh, trying to make a case for disadvantage to a court? Um, so uh, that becomes very challenging in actually litigating uh, discrimination from a perspective of systemic disadvantage. And um, I just want to make this a brief point about uh, the kind of internal um, cultural and structural barriers in the profession and amongst judges, uh, which I think uh, Tulsi used the culture of discrimination phrase. I think we do have that problem in, uh, in the legal profession and also in the profile of who are judges in our legal system. And uh, that makes it also challenging for people to perceive and to have the kind of empathy that Talha expressed. And, uh, and recognize disadvantage. And I think um, that's something we should also be mindful of when discussing how to, through the law, use anti-discrimination as a tool for addressing inequality and uh, disadvantage. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Rahul, um, yes. if you'd like to give us a little bit on the same subject. Mm -hmm. No, 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 just turn the other way. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's an affirming experience to be here and to be uh, discussing issues of this nature uh, in a collaborative environment. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, there are four points I'll make, a uh, couple which are sort of more doctrinal and then second sort of around the socio-legal aspects concerned with the practical operationalization of discrimination law. The, you know, first is uh, in the latter category. So uh, uh, I'll draw from an experience that I'm involved in currently in the Supreme Court where uh, you know i'm representing an organization which has challenged the exclusion of the disabled from the uh, from police forces in india at the central level and sort of one thing that i have realized kind of drawing on what rupali just mentioned about uh, judges having empathy etc is that when judges are faced with these kinds of uh, new issues uh, Gauri talked about pushing the boundaries of the law. So when they are faced with new fact situations, which require them to embrace an idea which hasn't been tested before in this case, including persons with disabilities as part of the police force, it does require a certain leap of faith and open-mindedness on their part to number one, be able to visualize how that would happen. And then two, to be able to kind of put their weight behind it and try it out. It can be the easiest thing to say that, look, uh, you know, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if this happens? What if that happens? And uh, I mean, uh, someone for them to become a judge, obviously they have that kind of legal training and uh, e e even lawyers for that matter to be able to make arguments to that effect. It's not, so once you know what you want to say, you can always find a way to say it uh, with that level of training. So I think at the a priori level to figure out, you know, what your uh, commitment is to work and how open-minded you are, I think that that does make a very tangible difference in how cases are approached. Uh, the second thing I would say, and this is a doctrinal point, uh, and I really enjoyed reading the report uh, and the compilation of cases also, I think is extremely helpful for practitioners in particular. I think one principle that is missing from it, uh, which I would like to flag is the principle of reasonable accommodation, which uh, uh, has been developed in the context of disability primarily uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, uh, but is also applicable in other contexts. I'm conscious that in the hijab matter, it was tried to be applied, but the court was kind of dismissive towards it. But I think it does have applicability across contexts in terms of uh, you know, accepting and celebrating uh, diversity and making it possible for that to happen by providing people the accommodation and additional support that they need uh, to make that happen in, in, in the hijab case, for instance, a reasonable accommodation would be uh, allowing uh, Muslim women to come to uh, educational institutions by, by wearing a hijab. So, the th so that I think is missing. Uh, uh, the third thing I will say in this sort of uh, you know, goes back to uh, uh, a sort of, it's a more socio-legal point, uh, is I think that uh, at least uh, when it comes to disability rights cases, uh, I often find that, uh, you know, judges have this uh, thing that, oh, we sympathize with your situation, but, so there's always that sense of like looking at it through that lens other than a rights-based lens and you know, how how uh, uh, one's rights can be advanced. It's more sort of saying that, oh, the, uh, you know, practically how will it be done? So that's kind of a mind block that comes in the way. The final thing I will say practically, I mean, nothing to do with the report as such, but more sort of a general point is that when you do practice, number one, uh, we must also as a group think about what are the channels through which one can practically uh, practice discrimination law in the courts on an everyday basis, you know, even to be able to reach the Supreme Court uh, and actually bring the treatment that you have faced to light and actually obtain justice for it is something that a very small minority of people who face discriminatory treatment are able to do. And then even uh, the backlash that you face when you take up such cases, so just to give a couple of examples, Mr. Kirpal is here and we all are familiar uh, with the government's uh, 
pushed back against his appointment with the college has of course responded to in very strong terms but so that's kind of one level of backlash you can't just practice discrimination law for a living we don't have that kind of a system so therefore practically speaking how, how can we make it possible for more lawyers to be able to bring forward such cases is something to which i think we should devote our collective attention thank you thanks thanks so much uh, uh, and that does give us a lot of food for thought especially those of us who are in the law um, so uh, this i guess uh, alu would you like to uh, chip in about your yeah yeah Thanks, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I've had to run in a few minutes, uh, but I'll take a very brief time and I'll try and log back for the final session. Uh, I'll take two very brief minutes uh, to address what I'm talking about, and this is on the larger point. And uh, I think one issue that discrimination law in India has suffered is this AK Gopalan approach of treating individual fundamental rights in each in a separate compartment. Um, somewhere, uh, even though rhetorically the Supreme Court says 14, 19, 21, 14, 19, 21. The three articles uh, conceptually they limit equality to just 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, and 18, which I think is the wrong approach because the approach was laid down for us by Baba Sahib Ambedkar in his final speech in the Constituent Assembly, uh, where he sort of linked three concepts, which is liberty, equality, and fraternity. And uh, I was, if I had a little bit more time, I'd have read out that passage to you. Uh, maybe I can uh, share the link or the share the text with. Uh, Lalit or, uh, or Ritrika, and maybe you can read out a little bit more, but essentially these three concepts feed into each other. Um, liberty and equality, which we talk about all the time, but the topic we don't talk about is fraternity. In fact, a recent book by uh, Akash Singh Rathor suggests that fraternity is not even the right word for it, because Baba Sahib Ambedkar himself later on in life preferred the term metta. Metta is a term which comes from old Prakrit, and doesn't have a very clear meaning in the English language, at least the best people have been able to translate is loving kindness. So fraternity has an unfortunate history in the sense of it comes from the French Revolution and is limited by the context in which it came about. Meta has a very different meaning. And I believe that if we really want to enrich equality jurisprudence and therefore anti-discrimination jurisprudence in India, and when I jurisprudence, I don't just mean the judgments of courts, I mean how the laws should approach questions of equality, that has, it has to be tinged with an understanding of this concept of metta, which is in the speech mentioned as fraternity, which I think is goes beyond just simple tests of is this discrimination, not discrimination, who is it affecting, who is it not affecting, in what position they are. It asks for a slightly larger perspective on this topic and in this concept. So. I just wanted to introduce it into the discussion, and I think this has been a fascinating opening uh, thing. I don't want to take up any more time. So thanks a lot, uh, Lalit. I'll try and join you guys again uh, as soon as this one obligation is done. Thank you. Thank you, Alok. And I think uh, those who are working on constitutional law, we have to try and figure out, because we're so used to tests and principles and figuring out how to get these principles to apply to particular fact situations. What do you do with fraternity? How do you apply it in a specific mm -hmm. legal sense? That's something that we can really think about as well. Ganesh, you've been working on caste and identity, uh, especially in the context of how emotions play a role in political studies. Could you give us a little bit about how you feel um, we can be looking at this subject? Yeah, basically, when we are talking about the basic principle, uh, we need to also rethink about the basic. Means that uh, when we are talking about the constitution, constitution is nothing but a, a contract between the citizen and the state. But the question here arises, kind, kind of sociological conundrums that, that are visible around us, is to what extent uh, the people are aware about the constitution. Even most of the people are uh, in our country are not aware about the constitution. So we need to rethink how the very idea of constitution itself, uh, forget about the rights, that's a very different matter. The still people are, when they are hearing about the uh, uh, name of court, they are getting fear. So we need to uh, we need to also rethink upon this, how the sociological problem is exactly happening there. I can give one anecdotes. Uh, uh, one of my friends was filed a petition during the COVID-19 against the uh, Bulla Bhimsa Hospital in Sambalpur, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, we are, uh, the court asked us to uh, file some affidavit from the peoples, but the peoples are hesitant to file affidavit. We are trying to mobilize them. So we need to rethink upon this kind of issues that uh, lies in the everydayness of the peoples. So that forgot about this discrimination and all these. They are even don't know what is constitution, despite they have the 
who thinks that they are going to cast their votes and doing everything, their identity card, but they are hesitant to come in front of the court itself. So I think this is the point I would like to start in from this, and I will come in the next part in the cast and other stuff. What would you say? I mean, uh, what do you think that we are missing? Like we are having a discussion yeah. here. Of course, it's in different language. It's not something that most people even speak here. But what do you think it will take uh, to get more people to commit? Uh, the idea. The like, uh, I think I can pro endorse something like we can need to work on the uh, very complex language of law. We will work on the translation uh, into different languages. We can also disseminate the very legal awareness through the different public culture or the folk culture, uh, where the peoples can get awareness uh, among themselves and uh, and not hesitate to come uh, in front of the courts and in front of the legal practitioners. Even we can see this. Uh, Legal free legal acts. They are also not very aware about the free legal acts also. And even the institution like the district levels, legal acts uh, institution, they are also not willing to help the people. I experienced it from during this case only. We approached to uh, the Sambalpur legal service uh, institution. They are not uh, much more willing. They are just doing their work and like this. We need kind of awareness and consciousness among us also. Uh, because we are talking about the constitution, and constitution is about the dignity and other things also. What Alok was saying about the fraternity, that we need to deliver our own consciousness to the others. That's how we can assemble all these things and can deliver uh, into the justice and other things. Thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, Shudunje, are you? Uh... Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, please go ahead with the, uh, your remarks about the basics. Yeah, uh, I just had a couple of remarks. One is about uh, what Dr. Atre mentioned very illuminatingly about uh, the three-part test abroad to decide what is violative of the right against discrimination, uh, where you first decide uh, whether or not a ground is attractive, whether it's based on sex, religion, etc. The second is about uh, whether there is discrimination or disadvantage or whatever other term you might want to give it. And the third is whether that discrimination is justified. And uh, to, my, to my best recollection, as far as Indian law is concerned, that third prong is missing from our jurisprudence. And uh, to my mind, that's a good thing. Uh, that makes the right against discrimination an absolute right, unlike the freedoms. Every freedom is subject to restrictions in the interest of ABC grounds. But the right against discrimination is not. Uh, and uh, the only sort of exception doctrinally that I can imagine to what I'm saying is the doctrine of balancing. That the minute you, you start pitting the right against discrimination with another right, for example, in the context of hate speech, you might say the right to freedom of speech conflicts with the right against discrimination. That's when you start bringing in this aspect of we need to accept that even uh, discrimination is sometimes okay, if at all you want to give that leeway. Uh, but the doctrine of balancing is the is, is sort of the only uh, sort of exception to that. But otherwise, to my mind, uh, the Supreme Court doesn't speak in language that allows for justifying discrimination. The minute you find discrimination, of course, that's a huge, huge issue. How do you de define discrimination? How do you decide that this particular discrimination is on the ground of sex? Is Nargesh Meza right or wrong? Of course, all of those issues are confined to the first two tests. But so far as the minute you arrive at a finding that there is discrimination, I don't think Indian law allows you to say uh, it's okay, it's justified uh, for a larger public interest uh, or, or something like that. That's one. Uh, the other uh, point I wanted to flag is about what Mr. Rahman mentioned, that uh, the need for measures like the hijab regulation to be implemented by means of a legislation, that's a primary law, rather than uh, subordinate legislation. And that's a very, very uh, uh, problematic aspect of Indian jurisprudence, is I, I see a conflict between uh, some judgments which say, you know, anything that works to the prejudice of any citizen needs to be made by law and you need a primary legislation you have a line of judgments on that count but then on the other hand you have Indra Sani 
where, uh, of course, uh, the issue was, can you have reservations by way of office memoranda, which are just executive instructions. And there the court says, well, even though Article 15 is imp uh, implicated, uh, it's completely all right to do this without uh, having any legislation. So uh, I think uh, there's no clarity on exactly when you require a legislation and when you don't. Uh, and there are different rights in part three, just speaking textually, different rights in part three, which require a law textually. So article 15, for example, itself has many sub clauses, one of which I think 15.5 requires you to make a law if you want to provide reservations in educational institutions. But 16, for example, doesn't say that there has to be a law if you want to provide reservations. So of course, I mean, how far we want to take text seriously is another issue. Uh, but this requirement of a law is, um, is a vexed question, which I believe the Supreme Court has never clearly answered uh, by taking into account uh, a holistic understanding of part three as it stands. So those are the two, two things I wanted to flag. Thanks so much, Vijay. Uh, Meeta, would you uh, would you want to chip in about? We have been running a little, a little more than just play, uh, but we really wanted everybody to get in uh, a little bit about their basic stance about this because going forward in the conversation, uh, you wouldn't get the chance if you get into a specific subject to talk about where you are coming from and talking about that subject. So uh, I hope we are still here. We are still uh, ready to go for the first, the next round. Uh, we had actually scheduled snacks at this point, uh, but lunch has not been so long ago. So maybe a little bit longer. 30 to 40 minutes, let's try on cast and reservations. And with this, Dr. Sony, I wanted to start with you. Uh, I think this is something that you have written about and worked on quite a bit. Um, and we uh, there's a number of questions that I know he sort of shared with the discussants about what we can think about. Uh, those who have been working in this area, caste and reservations, they know how uh, the, the sort of language that's used uh, when we discuss this subject from a legal angle. Um, so uh, for those who are not aware, some of the basics that I mentioned right in the initial presentation, um, the idea, for example, that we accept that there are disadvantages that run on the lines of caste is something that was decided by our founders. This was, for instance, one of the first times in the world that it was accepted in a constitutional text that, yes, disadvantage matters. So in a sense, what Dr. Pillai was talking about was accepted in the context of caste and, uh, and in a sense about sex as well in Article 15.3, um, that disadvantage matters and we have to make distinctions in the way we treat people on these grounds because disadvantage matters. And uh, the way that was viewed at that time uh, perhaps has was still in a slightly rigid way as an exception. And that, that exception angle to reservations law has continued to haunt us in, uh, you know, um, uh, in continued jurisprudence about reservations law and about how we understand equality law generally uh, in India. So, uh, Dr. Sony, yeah. So, uh, I will begin with an illustration from uh, Karnataka, my own case, where we have a uh, law called the Prevention of Transfer of uh, Prohibition of Transfer of Certain Lands Act, the Karnataka PTCL Act, as we call it. And that uh, basically voids transfers in respect of lands belonging to the scheduled castes where the transfer is taking place without prior approval. Now, the intent in that law is to safeguard grants that have taken place in favor of such allotties. Now, the law has been used, it's been misused as a separate conversation. But the point is, you, you don't limit the discourse on equality by only speaking of reservation. You have to recognize other elements of those civil rights. Those rights are land, those rights are dignity, those rights are marriage, employment, employment in the private sector, and so on. Now, this PTCL Act is a one of its kind. It's only a state act. I think one or two other states may have it. But you don't have a, an equivalent law at the center, which means you're again creating islands of uh, inequality in a sense, right? 
And I do think there is a need for us to go beyond just the constitutional discourse and look at how local legislation can fill these voids. You know, I run a podcast called the Podcast CASTE, mm -hmm. where I interview uh, subjects. And the understanding I've got is there's no point in uh, you know trying to equalize from a condescending way. Our constitution can't be condescending. It has to be real. And a lot of my subjects have said, don't just speak of reservation and say, okay, now you're on your own. That sense of empathy and inclusion has to go far beyond. And uh, people have uh, mooted ideas of a Dalit university, of a new Dalit art. And why not? Right? How many of your, uh, Mr. Babu mentioned that, uh, how much uh, time or resource, say, in our museums or in our art spaces? is devoted or controlled for that matter from people from certain communities. And I think that conversation has to uh, move in that direction. I was recently on a panel relating to POSH. And I was thinking, why can there not be the equivalent of an internal committee relating to caste discrimination, for example, in the private sector? How are you addressing it? We don't have well-developed thought law. I think uh, Professor Stuart made a reference to that. That you don't have special discrimination tribunals, you don't have a, a damages taught jurisprudence that is developed. Everything can't uh, begin and end with constitutional jurisprudence. You can't be going to the high courts or the Supreme Court for everything. And most importantly, how do you address these issues on an everyday uh, ecosystem? I will not go into the question of reservation in the private sector. That's, I think, a moot discussion that has to take place in any case. But something like uh, an IC relating to uh, inquiries in the private sector on matters of caste distribution is extremely important. Uh, you're seeing that in educational space. Today, your uh, IITs, IIMs, I dare say the NLUs are becoming caste institutions more and more and are showing that side. If that's the case, where is the scope of formal scope? I'm not talking about a casual. Yeah. Uh, scope of formal scope that addresses this element of discrimination. I think the time has come for us to be looking at that. Um, I think there was an important made a point made. I think Rupali made that point about uh, you know the life experience or the diversity that judges themselves bring to the bench. When you're talking about deciding cases relating to caste discrimination, then what is your sensitivity? I don't, I can't claim to have a personal sense because I don't have that experience, but uh, one has to work towards it. If the bench is lacking in that empathy or is coming from a place of prejudice, then how do you correct that? But this is, this is taking you to the heart of decision making. You're talking about doctrines, you're talking about principles, but those are doctrines and principles being laid down by the Supreme Court and the High Courts. And unless that sensitivity is there, um, how are you bridging that gap? Now, I do think here that I'm getting into an area of uh, reservation in the higher education. And that's a, this is a, I know it's a, it's a tenuous one, but that is again a conversation that has to be had. I'm reminded of something a colleague from the bar in Karnataka had said, that if you don't have reservation in the Supreme Court, the all cases where elevations do make do take place, there are times when those promotees feel beholden. So you don't want judges in the higher courts in the Supreme Court belonging to the scheduled caste, or for that matter, to, 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 to gender, to minorities, who then forget that identity. I think that identity is important because then that identity uh, translates into your uh, your sympathy, your uh, sensitivity in laying down the law. And as someone said, Tala said, looking at it from the point of view of the discriminated, to be able to understand that. And I do think there, uh, there is, I think, a need to renew this, this uh, debate about uh, caste-based reservation in the Supreme Court. I do think uh, the time has come for that to be seriously considered in the High Courts and the Supreme Court. Data is disappointing. We've not done well. On the, and I was recently on a panel relating to the book called The Court of Fire, where sort of the data tells you that you've done 
reasonably well on matters of uh, religion, perhaps, to an extent caste, much worse when it comes to gender. But the point is, in any which way you look at it, those figures are, are underwhelming. And if that cost correction is taking place in other strata, yes. then why not here? That's, those are my responses. Uh, would you like to say something, sir, about the, um, say, the, the basic question about, say, uh, affirmative action as a duty in the context of caste? As a solution, for example, we can talk about reservations, but um, is there something to be said about doctrine as well? About the duty question, for example. It seems that most people... Yeah, you know, just in a general way. Yeah, you know, you're right. Just addressing your point, sorry to... Yeah. Uh, first of all, you have lived experience and you of a person of a judge and they show land transfer. Just a quick anecdote of, of judgment that you on table anecdotes. I deal with judgments. Other people have lived experiences. I only have judgment, have a boring life. There's a judgment called Samta, written by Justice Ramaswamy, one of the first scheduled caste uh, judges of the Supreme Court, who interpreted the constitution to have a prohibition of transfer of land in tribal areas. That is possible because of this lived experience. Another chief judge bench or court, who would that? I go. I have some investment in that judgment. Uh, but uh, so that because the judges there were not called. So interpretation of the very same principle on transfer of rights. But coming back to your question on, on uh, for duty to affirmative action, it is a complete paradox because. When you start interpreting Article 16 of the Constitution, there was this idea of exceptions, right? Article 16, 4 is an exception. They're all exceptions to the right to equality, which are necessitated because of systemic historic disadvantage. So you allow for a, a, a reservation. That changed really from NM Thomas and then that line of cases, ultimately, really crystallized into law in Indra Sani, where they say that. Uh, it is really not an exception. Reservations are not an exception to the right to equality, but a facet of it. So you you reconcile the article, the reservation for portion and the earlier part of equality, and say it's one comprehensive whole, and reservations are therefore not an exception, but are an ingrained part of Article 16. Well, I ask myself, if that is the jurisprudence. You say that reservations are part of Article 16 and Article 14, therefore. And Article 14 is tasks duty on the state to ensure equality. Then by failing to have reservations, which are part of equality, you are effectively not complying with Article 14 and 16. There is therefore an inbuilt mechanism in your argument of including reservations as part of the right, a necessity, a corresponding obligation on you to ensure that there, there are reservations. But the problem is our courts don't really go that far, right? They like to make doctrinal points without following it to the logical conclusion. So when you make a doctrinal point and say yes, that 16 is no longer just an exception, but is part and, and part of the skeletal framework of the quality code 14 to 18, then there is a corresponding obligation on you to enforce that uh, that equality doctrine. So there should be, by their own reasoning, of a nine judge bench now in the Supreme Court in, in Indra Zani. A duty to have reservations. Uh, but that's when they become hesitant because uh, they don't want to go quite so far. Right. So I think there is there's this and very typical of, of, of courts. And I, I don't want to blame the judges. They are also functioning within a limited constitutional jurisdiction where they can't really overstep the grounds. Plus, it is a very fraught political question as to have uh, reservations or not. So when uh, a, a judge says, yes, you have a duty to have uh, reservations, what quantum, when, those are also questions that have to be left to the to the uh, to parliament. But will they then be justiciable? Will the courts then, if it is part of a duty to have reservations, then can the court not say, well, you must have a proportionate amount of reservations and not a representative sample. Now, this is a, goes back to this distinction between Article 16 and reservation in public employment, which is representation, uh, uh, kind of a, with the effect of representation 
and not corresponding to the exact proportion of a population as opposed to seats in parliament and legislatures where you're supposed to have a proportionate representation at equality of representation equality of opportunities those concepts of idea of equality what does that mean so those are all again fraught political questions which is why maybe the court goes that far and then gets afraid of the consequences and moves apart but given constitutional doctrine it is only but a logical extension of what the court have already said to have a duty Respond to sorry, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so um, I mean, I have a question of a very important question of whether uh, the reservation um, is a duty or not. I think it might be problematic to conceive reservation as a duty of the state, and I think this is particularly because which affirmative action measure to take or which affirmative action measure would be the best for the you know, for the disadvantaged groups might be best for the state to decide. So one of the problems of insisting that you have to do reservations, and that is the policy that the state must adopt to advance equality, also means that the state has to sort of, you know, if it mandatorily takes on reservation, then it cannot do certain other things. So this is, I mean, in Utopia, if you just think about a very well-intended state, a very well-intended state, researches and finds out that it is not the reservations which happens to be happens to, happens to make the best result for backward classes let's say broadly speaking it is for example certain other programs let's say targeted classes for their students from from childhood uh, targeted classes for students who whose parents have not had university education targeted classes for female students who do worse than uh, male students in certain respects because of certain stereotypes or certain associated notions or sort of social factors which are beyond their control. And the state realizes that yes, it is these actually these programs which will help us. It is these programs which will in fact bring them forward instead of having something that is uh, in, in the form of reservation only at the age of 18 in terms of education or in public employment, of course, when you when, when education, when, when education, higher education is over. So if, if the state in good faith want to implement something like that. I think insisting for a duty of preservation might you know, get in the way of the state's policy formulation of what kind of eco society we want to formulate, what kind of eco society do we want to create. And I think that sort of is intention with saying that. And that is, I think, possibly one of the reasons why the Indian constitution does not have a duty of preservation as such. It does not impose it. At least going by the text of uh, the, the specific text of preservation, it says that the, the, the state can. So of course, you know, and that is of course partly what the Supreme Court has said in uh, uh, past, I think, Pavitra and in Mukesh Kumar as well, that there's no duty of preservation. And, and I'm only pointing out that this might be, might be in fact, not something that's anti-equality, but, you know, something that is uh, more in consensus with the broader uh, framework of equality as a whole. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think the distinction between reservation and affirmative action is a crucial one, which then was the point that Lalit also made earlier. So while you may not necessarily you hold that there is a duty to undertake reservation mm -hmm. per se, uh, there may still be a duty to undertake affirmative action measures. Okay. Uh, I see uh, uh, Gauri had her hand, uh, sorry, Dr. Pillai had a hand up, if you could please hear. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lalit. I think Rahul <laughs> kind of covered my point, um, but I had a couple of extra things to say. So it was, of course, about making that distinction uh, between reservation and affirmative action and agreeing with Mr. Kirpal that if differential treatment, which is probably what affirmative action is, is seen as a facet of equality, then any form of differential treatment then becomes a duty. And if a reservation is only a singular form of differential treatment to redress disadvantage. Uh, you cannot collapse all of it into reservation. But also agreeing with Tulsi, um, kind of drawing maybe from human rights litigation more broadly to talk about why uh, reservations alone might not be the way um, to redress disadvantage. Um, so there is this uh, book by Gerald Rosenberg, uh, Hollow Hope. Um, it looks at uh, litigation 
of Brown versus Board of Education uh, in the US. And uh, he does empirical work on the effects of the judgment, which is, of course, uh, I actually, for those who uh, may not be uh, from the legal space, Brown versus Board of Education said that uh, segregation in US schools should not be allowed. So essentially, it said that um, white and black students should be put in schools together, uh, because previously, there was a separate but equal doctrine. So they could be sent legally under law to two separate schools, as long as the schools were equal in the sense of uh, infrastructure, things like that. But Brown versus Board of Education said that segregation is not possible because it's against the understanding of equality. So uh, Gerald Rosenberg looks at Brown versus Board of Education and more social legally as to how it's actually um, played out in, in uh, racial relations in the United States and uh, finds that simply integrating black students into white majority schools did not really help the students at all. So I think that's Tulsi's uh, point as well. And even Dr. Son, uh, Dr. Son, uh, Professor Sondi was talking about this, that uh, it's not simply about getting that entry point. And of course, the entry point is very important. So that is not to take away from the importance of reservation, but stopping there or the uh, kind of, yeah, seeing that as the only way to redress this advantage is quiet. Um, reductive. So I think that um, the general, I mean, of course, this, this hollow hope and his argument has really been critiqued in many contexts. And in India, we have a book called The Qualified Hope. Um, so it, it gives a different understanding of uh, public interest litigation. But I think the broad point that um, you need to be careful about what you're asking for because of the kind of implications that it has uh, is something that's very valuable about the empirical work that's done in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, you speak, you yeah, I, I think I disagree on the doctrinal point that NM Thomas implies a duty to um, reservations. Um, and effectively, what NM Thomas says is um, that uh, reservations are not an exception to the right to equality, right? Affirmative action is not an exception to the right to equality. So it says effectively that the problem with discrimination is not the classification of people. It's not wrongful because they classify people, but it's wrongful for some other reason. So likely it is wrongful because, and insofar caste classifications are wrongful, because and insofar as they contribute to caste hierarchies and entrench them. And so if we take that approach, um, which is decidedly a symmetric approach, we can still find out why reservations in no way, shape, or form violate the right to the right to discrimination because they do not contribute to racial hierarchy, uh, sorry, caste hierarchies. But it doesn't entail that the fact that we don't have reservations would in some form violate that right. It would just say that this is sort of neutral from a constitutional standpoint. Now, of course, one could say that you know the inaction of the state is really what has contributed to caste hierarchies. But I think that argument you can expand to so many different policies. I think the inaction to properly from primary education is something that massively contributes to caste hierarchies. But I don't think you can get a court to say that we should triple the allotment to primary education on the budget and just mandate this um, via judicial interven intervention. And I think at these points of sort of what can, can courts force governments to do in terms of inaction, we really run into, into deep problems of, of what courts usually can and legitimately should do. Um, in terms of their role in a sort of democratic setup. So I think for that reason, I don't think it really follows that there is a right to uh, right to reservation. Now, some people do say that, and I think I would mention mentioned it uh, similarly, that there is a duty to have some form of affirmative action measures, if not necessarily reservation. And so with that argument, I always wonder, so suppose a government doesn't do sufficient affirmative action measures and you go to court, what will happen? Can you now force a government to take specific affirmative action measures in a certain way? Can you ask them to have a particular reservation policy, especially if we draw the distinction between a duty to affirmative action and duty to reservation? Or can you ask them to take a particular other affirmative action measure? And if you can't ask the court to force a government to do anything in particular, then it seems it's an empty way of speaking about a constitutional duty to affirmative action that a court can't enforce. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's an imperative of justice that we do affirmative action, and that's perfectly fine. But I don't think there's any enforceable constitutional right. And I think doctrinally that is correct, that there isn't an enforceable constitutional right um, to either affirmative action or reservation. 
Um, that doesn't mean those aren't important policies, but I just disagree on the, on the sort of doctrinal point, um, whether constitutional law as it stands. And I think that the text of the constitution is fairly clear. It says, nothing shall prevent the state. Um, to read, nothing shall prevent the state from the state has to do is pretty big stretch of, of language. Um, and given that Anne Thomas doesn't um, conceptually necessitate this interpretation, I see no reason why we should twist the language so far into saying almost the opposite of, of what it's saying. It's just kind of, I don't think that there should be a duty. I'm saying that is the doctrinal implication, not just of NM Thomas, but how NM Thomas is interpreted in, in the Rasani. But we can agree to disagree on what NM Thomas means. Uh, so I, I, I want to make well, one, sure. like one point here. I think um, what I understood you to be saying was um, that the courts are using the duty language to justify an action that the state has taken and not taking it as far to say that hereby there's a right that's created. So that's the, I think, so I mean, every time, you know, the state wants to do something which discriminates or positively discriminates in favor, the courts will come up with a justification for that, and that is the retrofitting that the courts have been doing. I think I think that's what I understood from what the state of power said. I just wanted to take this moment to step back a little bit and actually go into that question of should. Let's say the doctrine currently is that the, that the government only has discretion to do reservations and they don't have a duty. Can we talk for a moment stepping away from constitutional law about the should question? For this, I want to go to Mr. Babu first. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit of context in here. In a sense, um, some of the questions one could ask us, this is some things from particular forms of analysis of uh, affirmative action. The idea should be that if affirmative action takes place, it should maybe not be left to a government that is, um, that is uh, elected by majority. It should be required by the constitution because that's the, con that's the logic of constitutionalism. That if there is a minority, for instance, the majority will simply not care for it. And if it is not required by the constitution, if there isn't any duty, that it's possible that they might just not do it. So that question of what is that right against discrimination doing in the context of affirmative action? Is it doing the work that we want it to do? When people are disadvantaged in reality, what should our constitution be doing in such a situation? Can we answer this should question? Is majority in politics the site for determining affirmative action reservations, or is it constitutionalism? Super majority in action. That has become de facto the uh, policy now. Uh, first on the nomenclature, up to mid 1980s, we were using protective discrimination. Yeah. You know, that reflects the constitutional philosophy of reservation. So, why we are here? It is discrimination in a way because you are traveling some groups against other groups. But there is a reason. It is discrimination, but it is a protective discrimination. But somehow, we imported this Canadian expression very bland, affirmative, actually, it doesn't really say what it is. I think if we start using protective discrimination for only some of the clarity would come back to the discussion. On the issue of the duty part, what is happening now is in case of SCSTs, it's not there in the constitution, but we have accepted a kind of proportionate justice. They have X, uh, they Account for say 25% of the population. So 25% of the legislative state seats should belong to them, not just there, in government employment also. They are following it. Actually, in states, they actually follow exact numbers. Now, that seems to be the argument by other groups seeking reservation, like the OBCs. Their point is yeah. OBC reservation uh, is about 24% because you should not cross. Okay. Yeah, should not cost 50%. Of course, the number again is still going now. Mm. But the main argument is nowadays, why don't you give according to a law? So, this is becoming a proportionate justice. In a way, de facto, it's going to be a duty rate of government. Just to see a number of a particular social group and give them that number. Will that work in this country with so many costs being sliced into so many hundreds of? Uh, South cast and sub I doubt it, but that's where we are going. One point uh, in the last session we talked about, uh, I think Alok mentioned about uh, the Ambedkar speech in the Council Assembly. 
In that context, when he talked about uh, the importance of fraternity, because without fraternity, his point is liberty and equality cannot be attained. After that, in some other place, he says, if society uh, refuses to have rights, who find these rights in the constitution would not make any sense. So that's again back to fraternity. Okay. Um, I just, um, I think Dr. Sloan, you might need to get you on it. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Bill, and I'm glad to see you again. Thanks. Uh, Alok, I think you had your hand up. Hello? Okay. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. Great. Uh, sorry, I was just in a car headed to somewhere, so, but I still thought I should just uh, join in for the last bit. Um. I, I I I don't have a problem per se, but I just feel that in 2023, I think our conversations on reservations in the context of equality and anti-discrimination are narrowing further. Because let's understand conceptually what reservations are. They only really work in the context of institutions which have a regular cycle of entry and exit. It works with educational institutions where there is annual admission. It works with government bodies which recruit on a regular cycle, right? Like they issue notifications, there is a certain fixed number of posts and so on and so forth. But where I think um, somewhere the discussion perhaps is getting a little stuck, and I don't just mean this discussion, I'm, I'm talking about the larger discourse of reservation in India, is that by and large, India has not been able to create enough public sector or government jobs to ensure that reservations have a full impact. The political class has always been aware of the true power of reservations and it's only 50, 60 years later, the judiciary and the legal side of it got the argument of reservations. So, but conversely, once the, now that the judiciary and the legal sector have understood the concept behind reservations, the political class has found a way to make it kind of irrelevant because while nobody wants to particularly say we are taking away reservations, the way it is being diminished is by not hiring, by outsourcing more functions to the government, and by uh, simply making a lot of positions within the government redundant. The government is playing a less and less of a role in the way in which it does. And this is, of course, the larger new liberal uh, discourse and so on. Likewise, the private sector, right? Now, it requires an education, I mean. The private sector is, plays a far greater role in uh, education, especially higher education, than the public sector. And in that sense, using a framework of reservations might make sense in the context of private sector reservations, but it absolutely does not make much sense in the context of private sector jobs because those are not always hired in the context of, uh, those recruitments don't hire, happen in the context of regular cycles. And we don't even know what a job is anymore. I mean, we're having a discourse on the gig economy parallelly and this other work that we're doing. We don't even know what a job is anymore. Is, is, it, is it like delivering the, uh, uh, you know, for Swiggy or Zomato or is it, you know, being a top CEO in a company? We don't know what that is. So I feel that by focusing, I mean, sure, it's, there are, of course, challenges and there are, of course, issues on reservation to be debated. I just feel if we can break out of reservations in the context of public sector jobs and education and go further and widen the scope into education and employment discrimination generally, I feel that will perhaps move the discussion forward. Thank you, Alok. Um, yeah, Dubai. Yeah. Um, on the should and positive duty point, I just want to throw up uh, socioeconomic uh, rights litigation, which is not necessarily given at any anti-discriminative, anti-discrimination frame, but in the it is really about a universal right that is going to benefit certain disadvantaged groups more who need that right more. And you're talking about those kind of structural measures. So um, we should also be asking whether an anti-discrimination framework is always the best framework, even if that's the outcome you're trying to achieve. Um, and some of this positive duty uh, kind of language has been more easy to get in socioeconomic rights litigation where 
you know, right to food, or even actually right to education, you have got continuing mandates by the court where they are saying you should and you shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, make these many uh, schools available or, or, or healthcare. Um, and um, I, uh, in that sense, you know, that jurisdiction also is narrowing uh, with uh, courts now less willing to even do that. Uh, but uh, in, in, in the political sphere, with this whole discussion around treaties, and you know uh, that that has also become a contested domain. But I wonder uh, whether we also gain by sort of allowing identity to take a back seat and, uh, and maybe engaging with the concept mm -hmm. of welfare or with social economic rights uh, to achieve the same outcome. I think that's actually a good segue for Ganesh to come in about uh, identity not playing a role versus identity playing a role in politics. Do you see what are the advantages in um, law encountering identity when it comes to affirmative action? Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to flag up some uh, yeah, questions along with Alo, actually. Uh, let's raise very really important questions uh, go forward to the new dimensions of the affirmative actions when uh, well, law actually not able to capture that aspect, but I feel also personally. Uh, since I'm working on emotions particularly, I would like to flag out something like uh, emotional condition, because when we talk about the reservation, uh, particularly in the context of SCHG, so we, uh, uh, we adapt this uh, reservation to provide some uh, uh, upliftment of the social status, not only the economic only and the representation, but also the recognition. But despite the affirmative action policy has been implemented, the affirmative action policy or the reservation has led to new dimensions of discrimination. For example, the stereotypes that you are also using the stereotypes, and uh, also there are, uh, you know, the, the reservation actually uh, creates new problems, a new kind of discrimination. We can say like it's a public humiliation, insult, and also now all these things like uh, there's a popular term that has been used by the uh, peoples in their day to day lives. Uh, for example, like Sarkar Kadamat, like this kind of term that is being used in the everyday language. That I think uh, the affirmative action policy and the state and even law is not that much able to capture that aspect. So I think we need to also bring some kind of act in university spaces, particularly uh, if you look that university spaces has become very problematic nowadays. Uh, the student suicide rate has been increasing. Uh, recently, there is a book written by Professor Ian Sukumar who actually highlight this kind of point, how we can see reservations into a new dimension. And what are the problems? I think we should also discuss more on this aspect. That would be new nuances of the affirmative action policy. Okay. And I'll come after. Good answer. Uh, Professor Enz Kumar, a caste discrimination in higher education, a critical analyst. I guess keeping these things here. Yeah, sure. Just an anecdotal point, but it's important. I'm not familiar with the uh, debate on what was in the private sector during the UPA time. So the government started asking private uh, companies. First, we want to know how many, what is the cost composition of your companies. The main problem they faced is since we have no quota system, we never ask this. There could be different different cars, there could be some SCSCs also. By now asking them to reveal their identity, we really benefit these groups. They came on merit. Now you are again creating these norms. So thankfully the government went and got a debate also. So we have this kind of problems that you talk about. We are not convinced that talk about this aspect. We said that. Giving any preferential treatment in the private sector amounts to last to be hired and first to be fired. Mm -hmm. the, the very flexible uh, job environment, where now there's a downturn, they automatically uh, sack some people. So then these guys could be the first to be sacked. Mm -hmm. Very complicated. So, uh, yeah, we will, I think, break for uh, snacks. In the next uh, four minutes or so, three four minutes. So what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please. No, like very briefly, I wanted to um, uh, add some thoughts on the idea of preferential treatment and um, and reservations. Um, so there's one 
very interesting study on the performance of IAS officers relative to their rank in, in admission uh, that is looking at the effect of reservations. And they find that um, in this study, um, SC officers overperform relative to their rank in admission. So that seems to be a kind of initially positive mark for affirmative action really working that people relative to their rank really perform better than, than you would expect them to. But then the authors broke the study down into how much they perform relative to the written exam and relative to the interviews. And they found that relative to the written exam, there was no effect on past um, uh, relative to performance as IAS officers. But they found that among SC candidates, uh, people who performed well in the written exam performed very poorly in the interview marks. So effectively, what they suspect is what is really happening is that qualified ballot candidates face discrimination in the interview panel mm -hmm. of um, appearing as SC candidates are deliberately marked down in these reasons, and that the only real effect that reservation policies have is to more or less equalize that effect. So if that is really true, and I mean, there's some anecdotal evidence for this, um, it's been happening, I, I gave a talk once where a Dalit student was um, telling his anecdote of having performed very well in the, um, actually, I think, JNU PhD entrance exam, and having given, I think, four out of 20 marks in the, in the oral exam, I've asked some professors and they said, well, yes, because otherwise we would have needed to get you into the general category. Um, professors didn't want that, they wanted you to take a quarter seat. Um, so in that case, it really isn't preferential treatment either. It is literally just equalizing the effect of a biased mission system. And to add, so, add insult to injury, it's precisely then happens what, what Ganesh is saying when you then get into that place, you're treated as if you have gotten preferential uh, treatment and you're treated as a sort of quota student or as someone who is less meritorious, mm -hmm. when actually the only real effect of the system is to unbalance a sort of biased selection. Mm -hmm. so, your Very standards. quickly, so uh, I was one of those candidates in the 90s taking civil services. Government realizes these problems. You know, every time government uh, acts to reduce these kind of discrimination, Somehow it backfires. Yeah. I'll give you an example. In UPSC, you have interview board, five members plus one member, ten members. When they realized that the SST candidates were not getting the appropriate part, the marks they deserved, then they made a rule saying that at least one member of the interview board have, must be a good person's member. But the way you look at the entire group is not about individual discipline. Mm -hmm. The same performance, for example, first I'll send you to a general board saying that you, you're a general category candidate. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same performance, you will get, say, 75%. <laughs> but the same performance in the SC board, you get 50%. Mm -hmm. So the expectations are so low that uh, in whatever you perform, they find one thing or the other not really. It's a really complicated and <laughs> There is a study also done by Dev Raj. Other uh, names, yeah, right? Last names, right? Yeah. To the telephone in Once again, a sobering note at which to uh, finish this. For, um, so for those who are joining online, I guess uh, we can aim to reconvene at 3.55. It might be on 4, but let's try uh, because we are running late. Um, but let's say 4, let's say 4, 20 minutes. Uh, we can have a little tea, we can have a little snacks or whatever is uh, whatever is the vibe in the <laughs> time zone. Uh, and yeah, let's use one, one matter. We will probably be starting with unlisted grounds, unlisted grounds, private discrimination and uh, among citizens. And then going to sex and religion. Uh, that's something that we have to reschedule a little bit. Uh, well, thank you so much for keeping coming. This is uh, quite good. I mean, like, not overall. We are still running quite late. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> so, um, yeah, one of the things that we I wanted to mention is that in each session, we have some speakers, some discussants who especially wanted to discuss that particular area or who have that as their area of expertise. So what we want to sort of, this is how we emphasize it, that they speak a little bit at length and then um, there's a little bit more free flowing discussion. 
And uh, that may be something that we can do in this session particularly, because we have some speakers who have who have worked in these areas and who have, you know, who are interested in these areas a little more. Um, so uh, one of the issues with this, and I think a lot to this entire round table, this has been another issue, is that there is too much to say, and it's difficult to pick. Um, and this particular session is one of those areas. Uh, we have tried to club together uh, the question of non-citizens, uh, unlisted grounds, which are basically those grounds which do not don't, don't feature in the constitution. Uh, grounds like sexual orientation, disability, um, and uh, this also includes differences between lists. Uh, the classic example that's given is that uh, discrimination on the ground of place of birth is uh, prohibited generally, but discrimination on the ground of place of residence is prohibited only in the case of public employment. So that means that some people think that it's fine to discriminate on the ground of place of residence for anything else except public employment. Um, this is another kind of question which runs along the same line. And lastly, this is the question of private discrimination. We have tried to club them together. It's kind of difficult to, to talk about them all at the same time. But the reason we have clubbed them together is that they all have underlined them this issue that the constitution doesn't speak about them. This question isn't spoken. It's not featured. The, the certain of these grounds, uh, the question of non-citizens and discrimination, the constitution doesn't seem to tell us much about it. And we are required as citizens to now think about what we can do with this problem. What can we do with the text of the constitution to maybe deal with the situations that do nonetheless arise in society? Um, so uh, for this, I'd like to start with Mr. Kipal. Um, if uh, you'd like to speak about any of these specific topics uh, and maybe we can try and subdivide it. Uh, unlisted grounds and non-citizens and private discrimination will Maybe it's going to get unwieldy. I, I can see it by now already. But uh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, whichever one you would like to speak about more. Are you combining each of the three or? Uh, yeah, the reason we have put them together is that textual question about the fact that they're not written in the constitution. But maybe that's why we can speak about them in the same language. What do we do when articles 15, 16, mm -hmm. and 29 don't talk about things? Right. Uh, so I come from. Uh, a positivistic tradition of the courts. Right? Words mean something and they have to therefore imply something. Equally absences also imply something. And that's how our interpretation of legislation and constitution is. And for me, at least in the context of Article 14, this will be 50. And that's the important thing. And that relates back to the question of the test that is to be applied for uh, testing legislative and administrative action is 14 is, of course, the genus, 15 is meant to be the species, right? 14 is, has two clauses. One is everyone is equal before the law, and then equal protection of the laws, which is effectively an anti-discrimination clause. First one being the Republican declaration of uh, the rule of law, English concept. 15 lists certain number, certain grounds. We mentioned sexual orientation. Now, of course, sex hadn't been in, in interpreted to include sexual orientation in uh, Nabdeh Johar also then becomes a listed ground effectively. So there are two ways to expand the idea of listed ground in 15. One is to the process of interpretation, broadening each of the terms mentioned in 15. And the second is, of course, to then say, if you're not covered in 15, you are nevertheless covered in 14. What is the implication of that? Because of course, you seem to have anti-discrimination protection in both. And that's where I think the courts have said, and, and that's the logical thing that can happen is, if you see the kind of listed grounds in 15, are all grounds which are innate to you, or even if not innate, for instance, religion is not technically innate, but in any society, it is effectively innate, right? None of us choose to be Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, very few people do. You're born of a religion because your parents were, and you carry on with that. So it's almost a question of as much of your caste as it is your, uh, or, or anything else. So religion in that sense is A, not only important because it is constitutive of your identity, but it is also virtually and in practice uh, in age to you. So technically I could tomorrow become a Christian or a Muslim, but the fact is very few people do that. And once those are innate or constitutive of your identity, whichever way you see it, then the strict scrutiny test can apply to those grounds of discrimination, right? Interestingly, that of course relates then only to citizens. 
which Article 14, which is the more generic clause, relates to only persons. So we are now applying the strict, strict scrutiny test only to citizens on the specified grounds, leaving everyone else under Article 14 to be covered. Now, what's the justification for that? Uh, of course, one is that these are important things. Courts are justified in looking and asking the state for a better explanation when there are uh, discrimination on the basis of caste or class. But Article 14 also covers the economy. Right? People buy our businesses treated differently. They will be included in the definition of person, the company. In Cooper's case, uh, a company cannot be a citizen, even if incorporated in India. Therefore, will not get benefit of 15. It will get benefit of Article 14. So the courts may think that those are grounds which are not so important compared to the Article 15 grounds, and therefore we will give them less protection in 14. The problem is when you have very important indices or constitutive instances which slip between 14 and 15, they're not covered by 15, and yet are very, very important and are not of the class which do not deserve a as much protection under 14, uh, under 15, as, as, as 15. So what happens to those? Uh, and for that, then I think the real way forward is to apply some kind of a sliding scale of a test of when to strike down legislation or when to strike down administrative act, uh, see the nature of interest. Is it akin to a 15 interest? Then apply a stricter scrutiny. If it is uh, not akin to a 15 interest, but uh, a more generic public policy, economic policy kind of an argument, apply a greater leeway in the joints principle. Right? So that is how the tests can work and articles 14 and 15 can be harmonized and 16. Look, we were talking of Hercules and the uh, empire of law and walk-in. I come from that, that tradition. Most practitioners come from that tradition. Most judges belong to that tradition. They will try to interpret these words of 14 and 15. And the most logical way of interpreting 14, 15, 16, 17 holistically is, is this is one such instance of giving greater scrutiny to 15, but to 14. The problem, however, is that that's not always clearly spelled out. Uh, so while what I'm saying makes interesting academic sense, and also there has some judicial backing to it. It's not as though there is no judicial backing to it. Now, Johar is one example. But for every judgment I give, I can give you three con contrary examples as well. Uh, so what we need is a crystallization of the ideas which form kind of the skeletal framework of the jurisprudence around unlisted grounds and listed grounds. Uh, and recognize that, you know, we say every time the constitution is an organic document. Uh, we are not originalists here. No one in this country is this original, uh, originalist tendencies kind of stay in the, over the Atlantic and don't come into India. Every judge believes that they can do almost violence sometimes to the text of the constitution as well in their quest for <laughs> ensuring justice or whatever form they want. So if that is the case, then there is a case to be made for interpreting Article 15 more widely or interpreting 15, which is more harmonious with the and identifying those kinds of uh, classifications, which all, all being unlisted, deserve greater protection. That will entail a value judgment inevitably. Right, uh, people will complain, and that's that. Why are certain classes of unlisted discriminations given greater importance when the language of 14 doesn't permit it? Because we are on 15 now. Uh, but to that extent, we have no option but to trust the anti-majoritarian institution of the courts, and that's inevitable. It may be a political exercise that is done, which all a lot of judicial exercise is political in that sense. But we've got to learn to live with it. There has to be, however, some greater effort of doctrinal uh, coherence which comes to this. And for that, uh, I ask the academics in this room rather than the practitioner who's currently speaking to, to assist us and, and help us because sometimes we flounder. We flounder. We would like to do that. Uh, but just before that, uh, Rahul and uh, Rupal, we'll just get um, these two uh, and maybe. Uh, and this is where the problem is coming up. Private discrimination, I'd like to ask you to see. Bastian as well, I guess. Bastian and uh, Dr. Pillai especially, uh, would be, it would be great to hear about. Even Mr. Rahman, we'd love to hear about. Uh, I believe you've done a petition on hate speech and such issues. So that, that's, again, somewhat getting into the private discrimination line. But this is the sequence, uh, Rahul. Yeah. 
So uh, on private discrimination, I'll speak. Oh. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's up to you. Oh, yeah, it could, be, it could be about understanding. Yeah, sure. I mean, like it's kind of both. Uh, so uh, in the context of unlisted grounds, I'll just say a, a word and then talk about private discrimination a little more at length. Okay. Um, so, you know, in the context of disability, of course, it is not a protected characteristic under articles 15 or 16, the area that I am most familiar with and work on day in, day out. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, of course, one aspect is sort of constitutional amendment to have it be uh, in the list of prohibited grounds under Article 15 and 16, but uh, that doesn't seem to be on the legislative agenda at any time in the near future. In the meantime, as a practitioner, what I find most helpful is the Supreme Court's judgment in Vikash Kumar versus UPSC. Uh, which says that even though articles 14, 19, and 21 don't directly refer to the disabled, uh, you know, the golden triangle applies to them equally. And the constitution actually requires that they be provided the additional support that help these rights, helps make these rights meaningful and real for them. So just saying that these rights apply to them is not sufficient. But in fact, uh, you need to go the extra mile and provide them the additional support that helps them exercise these rights. And it talks about how reasonable accommodation is itself a facet of Article 14, because the principle in disability rights law is that a failure to provide reasonable accommodation itself constitutes discrimination on the basis of disability. That's recognized by Section 2H of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act also. Uh, so if we read reasonable accommodation as a facet of Article 14, then it implies that a failure by the state to provide reasonable accommodation constitute a violation of Article 14. That's on the state side of things. Now we come to the private sector, uh, which is sort of what I uh, uh, have been working a great deal on. And my experience in this has been in the context of digital accessibility and media accessibility, and now also beginning to work on physical infrastructure being accessible in the context of the private sector. So in the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act that we have, there are provisions uh, that require all public and private sector service providers to make their uh, offerings accessible and there was a time-bound obligation by June 2019. So to that extent, there is a legislative hook uh, which I have utilized in uh, you know, there was a progressive judgment from the Chief Commissioner for Persons with Disabilities, which is the statutory authority under the RPWD Act, directing the healthcare provider Practo to make its offering accessible. Uh, and that was the first of its kind such uh, order against a private sector provider. And building on that, I've uh, sort of instituted actions against multiple digital accessibility service providers. Uh, you have given them a list of 70 plus service providers now which are inaccessible and they are taking that up. So that is important and there's also the uh, Justice Seekri's judgment in a case called Jija Ghosh uh, where uh, he, he finds Spicejet 10 lakh rupees Supreme Court judgment for discriminating against a woman who had cerebral palsy, supposedly uh, devoting her etc. So there's also that uh, which is quite helpful. Uh, and in the context of media accessibility, there is Justice Pratibha Singh's judgment in the context of uh, the Pathan movie where I had the good fortune of representing the British because it's an ongoing matter where um, the court directed Yashraj Films, a private party, to provide accessibility features such as audio description in the movie Pathan. Uh, and that was also a breakthrough in that it applied reasonable accommodation to the private sector. Now, and before this, I had an MGD this morning just to see if we can institute strategic litigation to make private spaces, physical spaces accessible, such as say, like City Walk, um, and kind of point out what accessibility issues exist there. And I think there's enough jurisprudential backing at this point uh, to be able to use that. So we'll see where it goes. Uh, but that's kind of what I want to do. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of tools that you have been. <laughs> uh, along the way, uh, but yes, probably this uh, this conversation maybe you can take it to non-citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thanks, Rahul. Congratulations on all those uh, leaps forward. And I think this is now sort of reaching a place where we have been able to tackle this issue that non citizens haven't been able to, which is that as a person and as a group, you would never imagine this part of the political compact that the constitution had. And that's why you're missing from that list, you know. And um, so you're not imagined as a rights bearing subject. And the legal architecture around your existence can be extremely harsh. For non citizens, you're governed by the Foreigners Act and orders under the Foreigners Act, which was originally conceptualized as a World War II legislation. Um, so we were talking about an extremely different world. Uh, we're talking about a pre UN world. We're also talking about a situation where there was literally active war and foreigners were imagined as alien threats to the British Empire. So the kind of uh, discretion that the executive has under the Foreigners Act scheme is just tremendous. Um, and they can pass orders, executive orders, uh, with directions that restrict a foreigner's liberty in every imaginable way. And um, this has not been really tested legally um, because, first of all, you're dealing with a group that is powerless and doesn't have any political recognition. So who is really advocating for this group? And uh, uh, the second uh, problem is that there isn't otherwise, the you don't have international instruments which you've been able to rely on, I think, a little bit in the disability advocacy because India is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention or the Statelessness Convention. So there aren't very concrete tools to, uh, to use to, to, to move this, um, uh, this entire architecture forward. And um, this means that uh, even getting a leg in the window uh, is, is very challenging. So even declaring your existence to a court in order to approach a court is a risk. So in that kind of a situation, being able to litigate uh, from an equality perspective is extremely challenging. Um, and you know what Ganesh mentioned earlier also, those who are forced into, the, into an interaction of the court system don't want to draw more attention to themselves. Uh, they're already on the receiving end of the penal face of the law. So uh, then to think about more proactive anti-discrimination kind of litigation is extremely cumbersome, extremely terrifying for that individual. So um, I'll actually ask Tala if he can come in out of turn, sorry, here, because Tala no, does a lot of the citizenship work as well to um, yeah, share. So um, one thing, even though um, we are discussing amnesty, but um, and the so example of discrimination in the context of uh, how citizenship law is being enforced in Assam, it encompasses all the other areas. I mean, there could be religion as an identity marker, dress, clothing, um, generally um, food that a person is eating, uh, then um, emergence of, you know, localities or ghettos for, you know, kind of people living together. This comes up before the tribunals? Uh, this doesn't come up before the tribunal. It could potentially. Uh, uh, actually, what happens is that you know, they may, on a basis of suspicion, they, the border security force, for example, on a basis of suspicion, okay. refer a person to a foreigner's tribunal. Now, uh, what is the basis of that suspicion? Now, there are judgments that say, look, you can't just simply, on the basis of your own subjective suspicion, send somebody. But then, in reality, what are those factors that, on the basis of which you develop that suspicion? It's usually, you know, what is the language that you speak to. So if you're Bengali speaking, you're likely to be an immigrant from, say, Bangladesh, as opposed to somebody who may have roots in uh, West Bengal or the historical Assam Bengal connection. Um, then the kind of food that you eat, then the area that you live in, if it's close to the border, even worse. You know, so the, those are the kind of factors. Now, these factors are markers for the force on the ground but doesn't translate in writing. So you can't say in writing that you're being discriminated or identified because of these markers. It's usually, you know, we, we have come, we have done spot verification on the basis of, um, we found that you could not produce any documents and now therefore, using reverse burden, prove that you're a foreign national, you're, you're not, you're an Indian national. Now in a state like Assam, um, with uh, uh, its natural calamities that happen every now and then, 
your left to friend for document. Now you may have moved places. You may actually your parents uh, may not have maintained the document or everybody are you know with that filing deadline the person you know how how well we keep our own papers uh, in the immediate past. So we understand you know for parents to maintain records and then to produce it at a time or a short notice asking by a police officer these are all difficulties. Now um, in it is in this context that you know reverse burden of proof triggers and then you have to prove that you are a national and. When you escalate the matter, then the prejudice is obviously is already attached to you because merely because it's alleged that you're a foreigner, the prejudice is attached. Now the question in the back of the judge's mind is also that look, I mean, there's an allegation that you are not even a national. Why should you even get the protection of the constitution? So then the question is with be started, you know, whether it is available to non-national. I mean, I have I or you know that person is a national. Allegation has been made, reverse burden triggers. Now I'm not a national, I don't even get the due process protection. So those are that's the context that um, you know uh, and, and and this has a lot of other sub, you know, sub, uh, sub or smaller factors. Um, for example, being married early. Um, then your um, uh, one document saying you know you're in one village, that village undergoing administrative uh, divisions. We rename something else. So in one what uh, what uh, in a total year it will be one constituency. In another it will be something else, and that's enough to raise a doubt that you know you don't even have a permanent place of residence. And having a um, you know small short memory or amnesia about the administrative changes that have happened in the middle, which that person may not even be aware of. And on the basis of all of these factors, you may already be classified in a doubtful order you know decades ago. So you know all of these factors are. And they just, you know, come to you at once. That's the that's the context. Maybe something you add about private discrimination. You see it in the same light, maybe, or uh, I mean, uh, so the difficulty of articulation remains. So um, you mentioned hate speech. I mean, I think one of the factors with hate speech was one of the matters that we were doing was um, there was an incident of hate crime in Noida. That did not result in lodging of an FIR. The man was prompt enough to um, make a complaint to the police. The UP police came to UP, uh, came to Delhi, sorry, the midnight knock. You know, the family is scared. They still persisted. They said, look, you're trying to sensationalize the issue, and therefore you know, just be quiet and don't talk about it. Filed a rape petition after after you know exchange of feelings, and on one fine day, the court said, all right, keep the papers ready. They were case a case diary ready, and that's the point in time about one and a half years later that the case is registered for the first time. That recognizes that even though your initial country, uh, complaint disclosed that there was a cognizable offense, which means that the FIR had to be registered, it was not registered. And the action taken was that certain police officers be suspended. And there is no accountability for not even acknowledging that a hate crime has happened, and that's where the invisibilization start, starts. The government is not willing to acknowledge. That there is a hate crime, and the same, you know, in the context of caste discrimination. So, whatever is being witnessed in the context of other forms of discrimination is something that is now, you know, being perfected or um, as a tool and manifesting itself in new forms of uh, discrimination. And what is your remedy if your if your complaint is not written? You again will have to go to the court, or um, assuming that it's written, uh, you only have criminal law to have a recourse to. Because you know what else will you do? You can't compel. I mean, even if you complain against the police officer, it'll have to be a certain framework. So the pigeonholing of remedies is a bit of a you know uh, problem. Yeah, I can see that it clearly raises because the law itself is not clear. The evidentiary questions are even less clear. So um, I think I heard a conversation during snacks about this sort of question. But <laughs> yeah, uh, Tulsi, you went into. Did you want to come in on any of these? Yeah, things? I mean, I, uh, maybe. Uh, Spend some time on private discrimination, which is one of my favorite uh, topics as well in, in discrimination law. Um, so I think, uh, as far as um, private discrimination is concerned, interestingly enough, our, our constitution has a very strong guarantee, I think, in fact. So I don't think it, it's a case where uh, the constitution is silent about, about private discrimination. I, I, in fact, on the other hand, think it, it, it says something very uh, prominently about private discrimination. And, it, is, it does so um, as different from many other constitutions that we have. I mean, if you, if you look at compare, comparative jurisdictions, you will see that a provision similar to 15.2 is, is, is absent. And 
why the green zone is unique is also because of the vertical history that we have, the vertical history of discrimination that we have. So if you look at the word that those are used in 15 years, it talks about access to shops, it talks about public restaurants, it talks about uh, wells, tanks, and bathing cuts, which, which emanate from a peculiar history, which Dr. Ambedkar, Ambedkar has also talked about, of being denied the most basic goods on the basis of your caste or some other protected class. So I think Dr. Ambedkar describes the situation as, as, as an incident which has deeply hurt him, like similar other uh, incidents that he has unfortunately had to endure in his life, of being deprived of or being just denied water by just asking what the caste is and saying that we will just not give you water because that's, you know, you're, 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 you're the right. And, and it, it's inspired by that kind of, uh, in that kind of history that 52 has been framed, I think it's, it's been framed for the, for the, for the right reasons and it's been framed very uh, uh, appropriately in the Indian context, uh, the kind of words that are used and the kind of connotation that's been, that's been employed. But the unfortunate part, I think, is that, and that's the contrast I want to point out, is that despite the very strong guarantee of, of private anti-discrimination in the private sector that you have inbuilt in the constitution, you have a complete under-enforcement or you know, unenforcement of this provision. So uh, the lawyers among us, if, if you look at, you know, if you just go to one of the digital databases of SEC or any other provision and look at uh, and, and just look okay. for 15 to you get zeros results almost. And that that's problematic, I think. So there are a lot of institutional infrastructural reasons behind it of course a lot of private discrimination happens in spaces which are too far away from the constitution if you will so it happens in you know in places where people don't have as much access to the court especially the courts and the you know in, 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 uh, under 226 or under article 32 the courts of, of the high court and supreme court and a lot of private discrimination goes unnoticed which is which is problematic in fact it also it's it's uh, unfortunately, that it also happens on a daily basis. I'm familiar with a lot of instances of private discrimination, as we all are. I'm aware of, for example, law firms in the Kerala High Court, which has, which have a uh, sort of untold <laughs> or, or just like an open secret uh, policy of not hiring women. So they they have they have a policy. I, I mean, they don't of course say it aloud, but they do think that it, it's better to have to have male lawyers into our firm rather than female lawyers for whatever. Uh, whatever reasons they might think. So you have an ongoing sort of you know, tendency of private discrimination and the unfortunate part is that 52 is rarely employed or used and I think that uh, there should be something to, to change that, either uh, better enforcement in terms of uh, uh, in terms of actually enrolling 15 to, to launch constitutional litigation in the country or uh, to expand the scope of 15 to and that's been happened, uh, that's happened through very few cases, such as so the, the, the one of the only cases or one of the very few cases that deal with the interpretation of 152 is the IMA case, which has uh, expanded the the uh, the scope of the word shops under Article 152 and has included uh, education institutions within the ambit with through a very uh, in my view very beautiful uh, interpretation of the constitution. Uh, I still think 152 or you know the law on private discrimination is imperfect. And I think the only instrument that can perfectize the law on, law on private discrimination is an equality legislation. So we have, of course, two drafts on equality acts, one drafted by CLPR and the other by uh, Professor Sarina Khetan and Arvind Abraham. And one of these uh, uh, legislations, the draft is also being noted in the social justice department in, 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 the, in the Kerala government. So we're still under this discussion, but the truth is, of course, that in the center, I would think Realistically, there is very less possibility for enactment or even discussion on equality legislation. And on, on state level, I think in some states like Kerala, I see the potential of something like this having passed. But of course, there is like a lot of discussion and political uh, 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 you know, <coughs> to like sort of uh, overcome uh, to actually achieve something like a comprehensive law on private discrimination. So I think there are um, yeah a lot of lot of ground to cover there. But I just want to conclude and the black two issues under private discrimination. One is um, association discrimination, uh, thinking of groups which are formed on the basis of one particular uh, one particular characteristic. So there can be very many examples are examples under this. So there can be sort of innocent, I don't know, women book clubs under this. 
and there can also be something like a very strong uh, Hindu majority again, a very upper caste organization, which excludes, you know, which excludes uh, other caste, of course, from its membership, and which also actively works towards, uh, you know, achieving some sort of caste supremacy. So there are different kinds of you know, groups which should come under this ambit. And one question which I just want to throw up on, or which, which I wonder is how to deal with those kinds of groups which want to discriminate and how to balance the notion of associational autonomy, which we, of course, have in our constitution under Article 19 of the freedom of freedom to form associations and unions, um, and the right against discrimination. And how do we how do we balance these values? And along with this, I think uh, one aspect also would be the ability of religion as an institution to discriminate. So we saw some sort of conflict of these two values in the Sabarimala case, where the court sided with the 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 the, the, the women who were being discriminated. But the, the question is, of course, you know, how, how do we how do we, how do we deal with this kind of conflict in all kinds of situations, and whether the ability of religion as a very strong institution, as a very permeating institution in a society, whether that have something to do with the reduction of their associational autonomy, reduction of how much uh, freedom we should give them, or how, how much freedom we should interpret the constitution to give them. And the other uh, issue I want to flag is a very interesting issue of uh, matrimonial acts, which I think Bastian has also worked on and may might have more to say about. But whether a society which uh, has a constitution, which is which is rooted in anti-discrimination, should permit display of matrimonial acts or dating sites for that matter, based on caste, religion, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a conflict here because there's of course a, a question of preference that I want to, or I prefer people of a particular particular character, characteristic and whether we should permit that, which is often, which is uh, sort of de facto permitted, or whether we should, you know, the law should step in and say that, okay, the law has some role uh, to, 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 do, uh, to do here. And this is, of course, done with this question is launched with the complete realization that the law cannot resolve inequality altogether in the society. It can only do you know, whatever it's able to do with the tools that's available uh, for lawyers and for the institution of, of law. But even, even then, I just want to flag whether, you know, whether in terms of considering how caste within the societies and how considering how discriminatory just like these on a, on a lot of aspects, whether you know controlling something like matrimonial acts will you know what what impact will it have or whether it will do us some good. Yeah. Yeah, it's like literally just you can at least can it bring the horse to the water? We can't force it to drink, but at least can it do this much? Can you not indignify everybody by putting them up as ads? It's a question of speech, maybe. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, Stephanie to just mention that. Here we're getting to those questions about the limits of constitutionalism, what the constitution should be capable of, and these questions about uh, a, a legislation on uh, private discrimination. These are things that actually people have, uh, Professor Khethan actually suggested that if we can, we should try and discuss it. That's something he's been on. He has shown himself to be very I think we should all understand it. It's something that we really need. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, Mr. Babu, and then I'd just like to hear from uh, Bastian and Dr. Pillai about maybe you can close it off. You can answer Mr. Kirpal's suggestion. That we have an academic solution to start out from for this kind of a complex problem. But yeah, Mr. Babu. In 2002, I was part of a, a group. We organized a major conference in Bhopal. The question we faced was how to increase the rights access to private sector. And we argued politically, which we didn't go anywhere, is that we wrongly defined private sector. What we meant by that is Many of these private sector organizations say that the private sector we don't have to uh, follow any of these constitutional guarantees and are benefiting from public money, like uh, public financial institutions like LIC, UTI. Hundreds of crores of rupees are invested in these companies, and sometimes uh, members of these uh, institutions sit on the board cards. Whereas government does a lot of procurement from this. So it's not always the matter of sticks in the form of legislation to force that, but the government certainly has several carrots to use to increase access to these uh, private institutions. Well, really they are not private, strictly. And even if they are private, government has enough resources uh, to prioritize, let us say, a big private company is willing to follow government 
affirmative action uh, guidelines. In terms of preferential treatment, you know, we need to bank laws, uh, financial institution laws. So that's the argument we made. The second is we thought uh, something like US uh, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. That model is a very big one for big enemy. Not talking about past, not talking about gender. Just look at a particular institution. Let us say the entire institution is kind of all 100% employees are only male, belong to a particular caste. We don't think any more test to say that it's a discriminatory organization. So there are several global practices we can adopt. No, these are very early traditions that we have to be. There is a difference between language in the Indian context. I'm actually very keen on this, these sort of institutional solutions. I don't see the courts having answers to this. Mm -hmm. I don't see the executive having answers. We need agencies, but maybe those have also not worked in the Indian context. It's just how I think. Um, yeah, uh, Machin and then Dr. Uh, sure. So I think I would say one thing to each of the three so non citizens and this is for some private discrimination. Um, so on non citizens, I think one of the things that, uh, that struck me when um, and I were, were talking um, was that there seems to be some room for, room for thinking about non citizens in terms of something like an anti stereotyping principle. So it's something that you mentioned like, for, for sex discrimination, but it seems really one of the grounds where stereotypes are very, very prevalent. And they're extraordinarily prevalent for immigrants from, from Bangladesh and, and from Myanmar, um, but even for relatively privileged immigrants. So you may have guessed that I've not been born in India. Um, and as belonging to a relatively privileged non-citizen or immigrant group, um, there's still a, quite a lot of stereotyping against people like me going on um, in the way of you know, having sort of very odd understandings of, um, of how people from, from Europe or North America are like. And so that seems to be a sort of commonality that one can perhaps draw on ideas of, of sex discrimination. Um, and I think even some of the, the reporting by more progressive journalists partially feeds into some of these stereotypes. So a lot of the reporting on citizenship tribunals takes a perspective of someone who's actually an Indian citizen and is wrongfully caught in it. And it's always seen as a sort of like, you know, if they're really Bangladeshi, then, you know, that's not really a big deal. And if they're really Rohingya who's fleeing from a genocide, then fair enough. Like, no, no, no. like really should have sympathies for them because they're actually, actually one of us. So there's that type of dynamic as well going in um, that, that we're struggling to kind of exert uh, sympathy for, for people who are non-citizens um, in this group. I think a, a few, Legal arguments that we're trying these tribunals on the CAA, one can say that precisely because it is about who gets citizenship, we can say Article 15 should apply um, because it sort of impacts current citizens um, in relevant ways. So just imagine a citizenship law that says um, uh, if you're born to Muslim parents, you're not Indian citizen, even if they're Indian citizens. Mm -hmm. A sort of such blatant law of this kind, I think you can. Make an argument that this discriminates against Muslim citizens because they have to be able to pass them. So I think you can similarly say because it's a precondition, um, those are kinds of arguments. How well they're accepted by courts is different matter, but I think just sort of you have to speak as an academic. So I'll speak as an Conceptually, that kind of ways for, for doing that. Um, when it comes to sort of unlimited grounds, um, I like very much the sort of sliding scale model. Um, and perhaps there's a way in which the Sort of mess that you describe in terms of test of discrimination is actually less messy in a way. Because um, you can understand Article 14 as providing a sort of basic level of review and Article 15 as a sort of heightened level of review. And that's something that, say, the US uh, discrimination law has a rational basis review for anything, and they have strict scrutiny for particular traits. And what you're proposing is perhaps they're kind of other traits that have some kind of intermediate review that would be grounded in Article 14, um, but still more ambitious than a sort of mere rational basis group. Um, so textually, we'll be grounded in 14 because that's that's the reason go. And I think because 14 uses sort of vague term of equality or like mm -hmm. treating someone as an equal, I think that's perfectly consistent with the language there. Um, so I think you've you've solved the problem in a way. Um, I think the one yeah, thing that I want to yeah. the one thing that I want to add is uh, that I'm concerned about the focus on immutability as traits, largely because there are many traits that are immutable that are super unimportant. Your eye color is immutable. Mm -hmm. The day of the week that you are born is immutable. 
the size of a pancreas is immutable. And if there was any kind of, and the latest to that birthday and pancreas actually proposed by people as a very fair way of assigning kind of, um, of having lotteries being run because we typically don't know when people are born and, and what the size of their pancreas is. Um, so in these kinds of scenarios, we're less troubled by it. Um, so I think what really troubles us about trade is not so much immutability, but what Gary mentioned, um, what's really, really troubled is disadvantage. So the trades that we're talking about um, that are protected in the constitution are the ones that have deep levels of, of inequality rooted in it. And so just to, to add one of my uh, uh, pet projects that I'm working on, I think it would necessitate us to take something like socioeconomic status a lot more seriously as a potential ground of, of discrimination. And I think the fact that socioeconomic status is mutable, that people can become rich and poor, um, is a poor reply to, um, uh, to say that we shouldn't care about bias against people for how wealthy or, or unwealthy they are. So kind of poor laws that are clearly by a sort of biased understanding against, well, and the boundary laws are very good example. Um, I think they're very often motivated by, um, by prejudice and animus against people um, uh, that are struggling in life and that have low socioeconomic status. Um, I think there's a lot of complications once you expand the idea of, of socioeconomic discrimination, uh, especially to indirect discrimination, but sort of at least as a step for some of the very direct forms of, of socioeconomic discrimination, I think they should fall within sort of an intermediate one. Um, lastly, on private discrimination, um, I mean, there's an interesting paradox here that um, uh, policy rightly pointed out, there are strong provisions in there, um, but they're hardly ever used. And I think there's a good analogy of Article 70. Um, untouchability provision, um, I think it's a great symbolic step, but by itself, legally, it has done very little. Um, and uh, it's interesting in the sort of, um, in the history of many of these, of these cast moves, um, it's one of the things that in the legislative, legislative debates always comes up. That, um, the conservatives who are very skeptical and say, this is anyway, it's not gonna move anything. And they come out as a bad guy of, of history, but they seem to be right. So the introduction has very little, little tangible effect to it. Um, and I think that's partially because we need some kind of infrastructure for it. For untouchability, we have the SES Trust Peace Act, which we can get into why it doesn't quite achieve what it, what it can achieve. So I think it's right that something like anti-discrimination law would be a good step. I think the main concern here is that um, even in progressive states like communist rule of Kerala or DMK rule of Nadu, it seems very difficult to get them uh, to get them adopted. And I think part of the concern is that um, politicians like to act on things where there's public concern or public pressure on it. And that just doesn't exist. Like anti-discrimination laws are effectively elite-driven ideas of people like us coming up as wouldn't this be a great idea? And it is a great idea, but somehow we struggle to communicate this to, uh, to groups that really have ground level pressure for it. Um, and that seems to be one of the something boxes as well as the Canada government. They're like, we're not gonna get into like a big fuss with everyone unless there is some kind of ground level, ground level um, struggle for it. So that I think is, I mean, that's a slightly less academic point, but that I think is a sort of practical stumbling block. Um, and as long as sort of in Canada society, an upper caste organization like the Naya Service Society, it's just a really important political actor um, and seen as a perfectly normal organization. Um, it seems very difficult to build up this, uh, this group. But lastly then, um, uh, I like your suggestion about sort of um, trying to more creatively look at the public-private entanglement. Um, so in the US, the Civil Rights Act is effectively doing that. So the Civil Rights Act, I mean, educational institutions work constitutionally a differently in India, but the general idea is the Civil Rights Act does not apply to private educa educational institutions in the US unless they get federal money. And virtually every university gets federal money. So in principle, university like Harvard or, um, um, or Princeton um, wouldn't be applied, uh, wouldn't be under the Civil Rights Act. So the latest affirmative action case wouldn't really apply to Harvard because they're private and they can do whatever they want. But it applies because Harvard takes federal money from federal funding sources. So you can have the same thing for businesses. As long as you do business with the central government, you have to abide by these and these norms. And given that the sort of large share of the economy or a decent share of the economy is in government businesses, 
this would sort of penetrate very deeply into the private sector. So I think I like that idea of kind of looking at the entanglement of private pra uh, uh, private public um, situations and, and use clause that um, sort of get you on the hook as long as you interact with the public sector. And can I just give one example of maybe uh, a way in which I see it operating in? Under the, um, so for to protect smaller companies, there is a legislation called Medium Small Small uh, Enterprises Act. Now, under that act, there's a special uh, dispute resolution mechanism that is provided, um, which even which says that if you're dealing with smaller companies who are registered under the act, then um, in the event of default, you're going to pay three times the interest rate. And you will not be able to take benefit of the excess interest rate in your uh, tax filings as, as an expense. So, I mean, where the government wanted to balance the private competing right, it has done so by legislation. Uh, Dr. Pillai, I just want to turn to you, but before that, I wanted to propose something. Uh, so, I was thinking that, uh, Dr. Pillai, I turned to you about what we are discussing right now uh, for your views on it. And then perhaps uh, seamlessly or as seamlessly as you can, we can also just move into the question of sex discrimination as well. And we can open with your views on it, um, how you see the question in India right now. And because we are so behind on time, I was thinking if it is all right, and this is something that's terrible to say, but should we just discuss sex discrimination and religious discrimination as part of one 40 minute session? And we can do away with closing remarks. If there are closing remarks, we can have it in that session itself. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I think that's all right. All right. Uh, Dr. Bilek. Yeah. Um, thanks, Lalit. Um, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so, then I think Bastion's already covered more or less what I want to say on analogous or unlisted uh, grounds, um, especially the point about immutability, mutability, and probably, again, disadvantage coming in in some sense as an as an organizing principle. Um, so I'd say something about the limits, I suppose, of horizontality of rights or, or um, private discrimination, which is a point that uh, Tulsi also brought up right now uh, about uh, Tulsi mentioned it in the context of associational autonomy. But I mean, the classic example is um, is the dinner party example, which is that uh, if private discrimination is, is is prohibited constitutionally, would that mean that if I were having a dinner party at my house and I chose to curate my list of guests based on characteristics that are important to me, I would get caught under the constitutional prohibition in some way because I'm a private party who is discriminating based on prohibited grounds, right? And that to a lot of people, I don't know how many in the room, but to a lot of people that seems like too much state interference in, in organizing of private life. So there seems to be a tussle between, of course, private party discrimination is dangerous and some forms of it must be prohibited, but not to the full and complete extent. And the question then, the academic question, the practical doctrinal question is, where do we draw the line? What are the limits? How do we conceptualize it? Uh, so in my role as an academic, I would like to point you to uh, a work that uh, I've recently engaged with and been sort of uh, and seen the development of. Uh, I'm sure some of you are aware of it, but uh, it is um, Gautam Bhatia's uh, new book on um, the institutional approach and horizontal rights. And um, so in it, I'd, I'd kind of encourage those people who are interested in the question to take a look at it. You may completely disagree with his view and uh, may have reservations and how he defines some of these concepts, but essentially he proposes what he calls an institutional approach to set the bounds of uh, private party, I mean, pri um, yeah, private party discrimination. And he says that he defines certain situations in which private party discrimination becomes unconstitutional. And these situations are linked to what he calls an institution existing. So an institution in simple terms, he understands as racism or casteism or patriarchy, things like that. Um, and, uh, and two other criteria which have to be satisfied. And if these criteria are satisfied, then um, private uh, sort of constitutional discrimination prohibition can extend to private party relations. Um, so again, and, and he engages quite extensively with intellectual history and thought on this issue from across the world. And he gives two examples of case studies with uh, the platform work, gig economy example, and uh, domestic labor. Um, so I think that it's an 
again, like I said, um, I'm not necessarily endorsing its conclusions as much as pointing towards the work as a place to start thinking about a conceptual framework on where to draw the line on private party um, discrimination. And um, yeah, if, if anyone reads it and has thoughts and would like to discuss, of course, please uh, reach out to Gotham or I mean, I'm also happy to chat about it. Um, Oh, on on sex discrimination, I think sex discrimination is something that I worked on um, a fair amount in. Uh, so I got introduced to the area of discrimination law through uh, my PhD, uh, which I completed uh, a year and a half ago at this point, um, uh, which looked at the issue of reproductive rights in India and brought a discrimination law framing to it. So um, uh, one of the things that the report really highlights is are the areas from which discrimination law or equality law is really absent. And reproductive rights is most definitely um, one of them because these rights are typically seen as um, components of your right to privacy, your life, or liberty, so under Article 21. Uh, and my PhD thesis sort of pushes back against that and um, concept and sees what equality law could do to the constitutional imagination of these rights. Um, so that brief introduction was to say that that's my um, in into understanding um, equality law and uh, sex discrimination law. I would say that something that's distinctive is that of all the different grounds that we have already discussed or are going to discuss further, probably sex discrimination, I would say, is the most advanced. Um, it's where the doctrine has seen the most developments. So all of the cases that we've been discussing as positive examples of uh, the development of equality law, most of them have happened in the area of sex discrimination, with sex being defined broadly to include gender identity and sexual orientation. So starting all the way from, say, Nas um, and Anuj Garg in 2009, to Nitesha in uh, 2021. I mean, that whole trajectory of eight to nine cases have, have really shifted our sex discrimination jurisprudence. And um, the biggest contribution I would say is to sh move away from the only um, test. We've already discussed that, uh, but the implications of that has been, of course, to bring the uh, bring the stereotyping principle very strongly into uh, Indian constitutional law. It has also opened the gates to indirect discrimination and it has open the gates to intersectional discrimination because oh, the, the only test kind of barred all these three things previously. Um, so I would say that of all the different grounds, sex discrimination is the most advanced. A place where it hasn't really gotten to yet is um, uh, what Shritanje also highlighted earlier is the question of justification, what standard and test of justification should we apply. And this was also the discussion between Mr. Kripal and Bastian about um, the varying standard uh, strict scrutiny or, or so reasonable classification, of course, is too low a standard. One might read Nas Foundation and Anujgarh to say that there is a proportionality standard that's been brought into discrimination law, but the later cases, um, including Navtej, Natisha, etc., don't really apply the proportionality standard. Um, so it's not reasonable classification, but we don't really know what the standard is. So there's like a huge question mark there. And that one way to interpret it, I think, maybe to say that discrimination law is or discrimination is an absolute right, as Shatanjay was saying. I don't know if if that's the best interpretation to put, because then it then you go into the question of what you define as discrimination. And if, say, forms of differential treatment are um seen as you know, uh, as, as seen as not falling within that category. So justification is an important tool um, in that sense. And seeing discrimination as an absolute right may not be uh, the win that we think it is. Uh, so yes, the standard of justification is, is still uh, quite ambiguous. Um, and apart from Anuj Garg and uh, Nas, I don't think we have much indication of what that standard could be if we don't want to go back to a reasonable classification test. Um, uh, the the last thing I want to close with is 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 thinking about why sex discrimination has sort of leaped forward um, so much more than other grounds of discrimination, and I think it really goes back to what Shreya mentioned about political about uh, the political consensus. So obviously, the litigation or or law is a political entity, and um, and it is responding to the politics of the time or, or responding to society. So, I mean, of course, I think these cases are extremely important, but I also think that they are politically the least dangerous um, 
kind of discrimination law cases to endorse as opposed to say religion or caste which is politically a lot more turbulent and uh, difficult uh, and it invokes strong backlash. So compared to that um, dis uh, discrimination on grounds of gender, it's not that patriarchy is not is not widespread or that you know that's not one of the organizing principles of the state. But but in terms of where the judiciary can safe, I think more safely intervene to push back against some of the trends sex discrimination provides a forum for that uh, i also kind of feel similarly about reproductive rights in india because india has a fairly in some ways at least you can say a robust jurisprudence on it and once again i actually feel like while that's really helpful the motivations behind it are maybe less jurisprudential and more responding to the kind of interventions that can be made in this political context. So where can rights really be utilized or where can the where can equality law really have teeth? Um, and it seems like it can have more teeth for some grounds than others motivated by the political context that we live in. Um, that's not to say that these cases are not important, but I think that helps us understand why there's a slightly lopsided development, I would say, in uh, equality law um, in India. I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing um, the other thoughts on sex discrimination. Uh, Dr. Kalai, just quickly, I just wanted a brief understanding from you. Do you see the jurisprudence on certain grounds spilling over to others or maybe, God forbid, moving the other way? Uh, bad jurisprudence from other grounds moving on to sex discrimination, for example. Uh, how do you see that happening? Are courts being indisciplined when they're not treating the grounds the same way? I think, uh, yes, they are being indisciplined. I mean, the, ideally for example, the only test should not only apply to sex discrimination because it's an interpretation of 15.1 which cuts across the grounds. But we have really seen the application of it only in the context of sex discrimination. So uh, can we be hopeful that things go the other, I mean, that sex discrimination spills over into the other ground. So that's what I was trying to say that I think doctrinally, yes, politically, I don't know, uh, because I don't think it's a question of doctrine alone. Whether retrenchment on sex discrimination is going to happen, I think that's also a little <laughs> unlikely um, because I think that that would also invite a kind of really uh, a scrutiny of, of judicial action uh, from certain um, parts of um, legal thought, including myself, probably. Um, so I think that may be something that would want to be that courts might want to avoid as well. Uh, but yes, I, I, I think that it's not simply a question about what the text allows or what doctrine allows as much as what can be achieved. Um, and, and understanding that courts are political actors who are sort of balancing between the constitution, um, the other sort of social and political pressures they are facing. Um, and yeah, I think that helps us um, uh, locate discrimination law just beyond the law as, as a uh, institution. Uh, Mr. Kirpal, if I may, uh, you had to uh, see cases in which sex discrimination, the concept of sex discrimination is applied to concepts which are not necessarily traditionally considered about sex discrimination. Um, and one of the things that actually we did manage to research is that this, uh, the test on only, uh, the place where it is scaled back is sex discrimination. But it does seem to feature in all the other grounds Caste, for example, a very simple example often uh, that, that's used in most, even in Indra Swani, is that the reason why reservations is not considered discriminatory on the ground of caste is at least partly based on the idea that reservations are not discrimination only on caste, but additionally on the basis of social and economic educational backwardness or some such thing, uh, or the fact that there is a presidential notification for SCs and STs. Reasons like this rooted in the word only, are used in caste discrimination. Even in those old cases on personal laws, like uh, Narasopa Mali, one of the reasons why personal laws were looked at as non-discriminatory was because personal laws were not only about religion, but additionally about the differences between readiness for reform, uh, texts, religious texts. So uh, how do you see this vast body of jurisprudence in other fields as well matching with each other? And it's again a difficult way to run this conversation, but as sex discrimination as well, particularly. Well, look, while there are certain listed grounds in 15 and sex and religion both form maybe part of it, our constitutional history, through the framing of the constitution, 
and how the constitution views these separate concepts is very different. Right? So there's a social compact really in terms of religion of here we give you secularism, now integrate with us. So the idea of treating religions as a separate group deserving of protection and equality is not a theme which is there in the constitution in the same way that sex and caste is. Right? So caste and sex is seen as something that deserves protection, additional protection. Hence, you get those reservations. So for instance, you have separate electorates uh, for religious minorities prior to the constitution. In the constitution, they disappear. Right? So the idea is assimilationist. And how the constitution makers thought of these different grounds were all different. And there were different ways that each of these were dealt with. And sometimes just because they used in an article together, we think that yes, all the tests should be the same. But the fact of the matter is that they're different lived experiences, different problems that each of these groups have faced. And the constitution has dealt with them in a different part of each constitution differently, right? So as I said, for religions, there is, there is virtually, uh, there is no reservation. The ground of religion. On caste, there is reservation, of course. Now, for women on the all of sex, including sexuality, you are sort of in the same constitutional position as a, as a religious minorities, but without those additional benefits of secularism in Article 2930, those those uh, rights are not there. So there are different schemes operational in the constitutional uh, sphere, really, for uh, for us to examine, and then. I think to expect that everything should be treated equally is, is not correct because uh, if the constitution doesn't, plus the problems faced are, 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 uh, are not the same for each of them. So I think there is some merit in treating and applying different tests to different kinds of uh, disadvantage. I think that's the one takeaway I have today is it's a, it's a good way to envisage and imagine the new, new, new jurisprudence on, on this discrimination if we are to be appointed as judges. Uh, all of us. <laughs> I study that as what I said. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's not such. It's not surprising that there are, there are differences, and the word only in terms of caste, well, it's not done quite the same damage as it has in the case of uh, of, of sex abuse students. I mean, you mentioned, of course, even the adultery law was upheld initially before Joseph I on, on the only ground. So, so there has been drawback from that. I think hopefully there's a dead concept, uh, but many dead concepts have a habit of coming al alive. So we don't know, I can't predict the future. For that, you have to go to courts, right? For the unpredictability of it all. Uh, so what was truly remarkable to me is the expansion of the idea of sex to include sexuality. Uh, that is something which is quite the leap that has been done. And that is happening in not just the idea, this fluidity, recognition of the intersectionality of sex and sexuality, also in the idea of the Sabrimala judgment when untouchability is attached to women, right? So this merging of different forms of uh, excluded groups or disadvantaged groups. So there is, I suppose, some kind of uh, equality of treatment. So this goes contrary to what I was saying earlier, that the constitution treats them separately. But in terms of legal tools, the courts are limited, right? They, they can't start uh, testing legislation on wildly different grounds when, when it comes to them. So they, they use those similar tools and will strike down. And therefore, they started merging different constitutional principles. And that's fine. I, I think that's good if you take a constitutional tool, you empower yourself to, to strike down legislation which is uh, oppressive. It's a good thing. But you must be aware you're doing it. And that is the one problem I have with the courts is that a lot of this is surreptitious. And it's not surreptitious because they know what they're doing and therefore they uh, deliberately try to hide what they're doing. I think sometimes they just don't even know necessarily of uh, what they're doing. I mean, for instance, why do you use sometimes A test, Y, B test, Y? There is no doctrinal certainty in any of this. And now we have this new integrated proportionality test which has come, right? Article 14, 19, 21 are violated, then out goes A test, B test, we have this integrated proportionality test, but all three rights are, are involved. Now, judges can always find how any of these rights are involved, especially through creative interpretation and expansion of 191A particularly. So this engenders also unpredictability in the law. So I, I'm slightly concerned about that. Uh yeah, I just have one small, I mean, maybe a connected uh, thought. Um, in hijab, the argument was very layered. 
in the sense that you know one way of looking at it was the first layer of discrimination against the women on what they wear or what they choose to wear. On the another level was you know what Muslim as a practice do based on religious text, etc. Now, um, unfortunately, the focus was on the second layer and not on the first layer. So that's also the you know what the judges choose to do and how they want to do. I mean, it's it's a black box really of reasoning. And would you say that that's uh, maybe uh, linked to the fact that uh, judges who wanted to permit or if they felt the pressure to permit the governmental measure in the hijab case would feel like the ERP test was an easier terrain in which to deal with that question? That's why they opted for that, maybe. So, um, yeah, for the for the for the court to you know justify it, maybe yes. But um, but if you look at it the other way, I mean, I would think that any court wanting to protect a liberty right, the easiest is to kill that on administrative law ground itself. Yes, that's right. and then to you know if necessary, get onto the ground of choice. You know what you want to wear, and does it really have any nexus with your performance? And end it there. The question of getting into religion doesn't did not really should not have. I mean, you don't really go that far. I mean, the judgment of the Supreme Court, that's a look for the other courts um, to get into all the other, I mean, trial courts have to answer all the issues that they frame, but the other courts may not. They may choose to, you know, pick up one issue and say, look, I can decide on this, I don't need to decide on the other. Mm -hmm. So that could have been done. And that's where, you know, when you when you said that, um, how is the development of jurisprudence on, say, one aspect affected the others? Is there, is it really, traveling from one layer to another, right? I mean, in hijab case could be an example to say that you're not even looking at their layer, going straight to the layer B, because you know, for whatever reason, that's the that's what you've decided and that's where you want to go. Uh, just a quick thing though, because on that same case, and uh, uh, we haven't really discussed about Nitisha and indirect discrimination really. Um, and I think, in many of our deepest problems, especially when it comes to uh, questions of evidence related to discrimination, mm -hmm. this question of indirect discrimination is supposed to traditionally be a tool. Just to give a background, sir, the, the idea is that you check it on the basis of effects. Is this affecting a group and not according to what the government is saying it is for? The government can say that what we want to do is uniforms. We want everybody to have the same uniforms. But does that not affect certain groups? more than others so your your intentions don't matter what matters is what really happens to people was this something in that case that you felt um could have done something could have made more difference no so the i mean it was of course argued it was, it was argued and more than one. it was argued but let's see i mean now the issue is in the supreme court let's see then uh, it has to be gone into by the larger length we'll see you know whether they take that into account but i mean i feel that you know this issue can be decided not to skirt the other issue, but can be decided on a narrower issue of choice. Because not that, you know, I mean, you're giving somebody or recognizing a choice because, but that's how liberty really functions. I mean, um, or if you, the, I mean, I think between 14, 19, 21, but what you're really protecting is, you know, people's liberty. You do whatever you feel like um, and, and um, subject to, you know, some restrictions. Mm -hmm. That's what, so, I mean, that's the best way to, you know, um, get people to, let them exercise their rights. This is a the age old problem about whether to frame something in terms of liberty or equality. Bastion would probably be aware that this is something that's there in discrimination law scholars across the world. They often argue about this. Is discrimination actually about equality or is it not actually about freedom? About whether you have a choice in your matter of, um, say, sex or uh, caste or religion. So, therefore, I think amendments amendment is phrased in that way. Yes, we put it put it put those two 14 but one together. But uh, Tulsi, would you like to chip in here about uh, sex discrimination but yeah. also any of the others? Yeah, I mean, the hijab, hijab case is a very interesting example, especially because we're talking about religion and sex discrimination. It's a confluence of, of course, of uh, mm -hmm. intersectional discrimination based on being a Muslim woman who wants to wear the hijab. And of course, I think uh, as this litigation is concerned, I think one of the conceptual faults on, on the part of the petitioners, at least before the Karnataka High Court, was to launch the Yabi argument very strongly and not to launch the discrimination argument seriously uh, as it deserved. So I think that gives the judges like an easy tool 
to some extent to say that of course if you're, if you're bringing the ERP in, then that is completely messy. And that is now telling us to actually determine what the Quran says or what the, what the uh, uh, Islamic scriptures say about, about wearing, the, wearing the hijab and how mandatory it is and education institution and so on and so forth. And there it's, you know, it, it could go either way because it's, the jurisprudence is extremely problematic and ask the judges to make theological observations, theological conclusions, which they are utterly incompetent to make. Um, I think that the arguments on discrimination simplicity are, I think, based on Article, Article 15 should have been launched a bit more seriously before the, for the uh, High Court of Karnataka. This mistake, I think, was rectified before the Supreme Court, and I was also part of the uh, part of the uh, uh, case. And both discrimination under, under 15 and indirect discrimination as well were seriously argued uh, before the court because it, I mean it was seemingly a neutral provision of something like we want to have have uniformity or we want to just have uniforms across across children across across students and uh, we, we don't really bother about anything else. Although I think I'm just trying to think, and we discussed it during the during the deliberations that what if there was a measure, and this was not really a problem in Karnataka because there was there were not a lot of turban wearing Sikh students in Karnataka. But we were discussing during the deliberations that you know what if in Punjab or elsewhere, or if, if there was actually a legislation or even any kind of executive inspection or an administrative order which said that the Sikh uh, persons cannot wear the turban. And it, it's almost you know it's almost exactly the same thing. It's uh, it, it's it's an you know it's an adornment that you that you wear on on the head and it's it's prescribed by your religion. It's required by your religion, or you you wear it as a matter of uh, matter of your choice. And it would be very difficult for all those I think who oppose who support the the governmental action in Karnataka to say that it would be permissible for the state to. Bring in a legislation or to just ban uh, back turbans, and then you see, you know, then you really see that that to to, to impose a hijab ban is problematic, and, and there is something else that motivates you when you say that turban is uh, all right, but but the hijab is not. So if, when you say that, I think there are a lot of stereotypical assumptions that you bring into the table, and that that you actually use about Muslims in general and about Muslim women to say that something is not okay or something is something is problematic. So I think it's these kind of these kind of stereotypes that uh, that are prohibited by the constitution or, or using these stereotypes uh, in our laws or having state measures uh, premised on these stereotypes. But unfortunately of course the hijab case like the trick politics and now uh, is being referred to, to, to a large event. Although I, I, I <laughs> I just fail to see how um, going by our constitutional framework and how well, how very clearly by going the, uh, going by the language of Article 14 and 15, how something like a hijab ban is 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 uh, permissible at all, you know, by, by looking at a, a at a theme. But um, I think there are of course some some uh, uh, advances that have been generally made on sex discrimination, nevertheless. Uh, and that and a lot of these arguments were reflected during the argumentation that it case as well. And our approaches, I think, on sex discrimination also have evolved over time. And uh, the adultery case is, of course, a good example because the very same provision was challenged, of course, multiple times to the Supreme Court earlier. And the the, the, the very the very same court in, in one way, at what one point in time in 1951, in use of the case, actually held that not uh, punishing women and only punishing men for the crime of adultery is a measure of special provision in favor of women. So the court uh, uh, possibly might have genuinely believed it that it is, you know, it is punishing punishing one group and not punishing the other. The other group being the victims of threat and acts is is a measure of measure of you know a very interesting affirmative action or sort of protective uh, measure under under fifteen three. And it is the very same court that several years. Later says that if, if, you're, if you're, you're talking about equality, let's actually talk about women not in the language of victims, but as equal citizens or, or as equal persons. So that jurisprudence, of course, has, has been has been very beneficial, and I think uh, there is, of course, a lot more to achieve in terms of, of uh, sex discrimination uh, jurisprudence. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I want to say something about what. <clears throat> uh, 
came out in the discussion on the HR case, and I think came up as well when you mentioned about indirect discrimination moving away from the concept of, of intention, I think was something that we also mentioned. So I think it's a good sense to insist that discrimination has to be intention. But I have some concerns about the complete erasure of ideas of, of intention in, in discrimination law. And so as I looked at the hijab case, um, it's, it was to me a classical case of what um, uh, Egon and I can call second order discrimination. So he said second order discrimination is first, is ordinary discrimination in the selection of criteria for benefit. So if you select the neutral dress code in order to harm Muslims, then Eidelson calls it second order discrimination. And I think that's precisely what happened. And the example with the curtain is, is exactly that. No one would have made a law that would have said, um, you know, Sikhs can't wear turbans in, in school, and we had a Sikh prime minister wore a turban at every single event. Um, and there's a reason why this policy was proposed in, in Karnataka and not in Delhi, where there's a substantial Sikh population and so on. So, in a way, and, and I understand the courts will be anxious to say a government, you're biased against Muslims, um, because that will be perceived to be political and so on. Um, but it, it still seems a shame, at the very least, for how broader public discourse functions around discrimination, that no one is willing to talk about intentions behind, behind policy. I think the same for the CAA. Um, I read so many legal analysis that called it um, a sort of arbitrary provision. And I understand where that legally comes from because we have to talk about Article 14, so you have to talk about the arbitrariness, so you use that language. But it creeps in political discourse. And to me, as um, at least a part non lawyer, it just seems that it's getting the thing exactly backwards. The CCA was precisely not arbitrary. It was precisely targeted in order to exclude Muslim groups. And that wasn't just arbitrary in the sense of random, it was decidedly targeted. And that whole angle got sort of lost in the discussion. And so I think, well, I think there's a very important bit to move beyond attentions. There's also danger in completely ignoring cases in which mm -hmm. intentions are an important component. I think the Ajak case and the CAA case are, are two examples. And I said why well, courts often don't want to go that way. But I fear that even the, as you mentioned, the sort of public discussion that is, that is tied up with it, that even in the public discussion, there's a sort of creep of legal discourse that just completely eliminates and we just openly say what is going on, namely that this is a new majoritarian government. They don't like. Muslim girls to be educated, they want to drag Muslim girls out of school, that's bad. Something as simple as that is something that we that we fail to address by saying it shouldn't be about intention. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, it, it just really is about intention, it's really important. Um, so yeah, that was just kind of one, one comment. I, I think the framing in the job case was not from the intention point of view, because legally speaking, it's very hard to you know, prove that. So the, the way to deal with that is to look at the effect. Yeah. Which is what I think he was pointing out. I, 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 would, have, I would have just... I have everything I need to know. That's the elephant in the room. <laughs> that's the elephant in the room. You don't really need to talk about it. It's easy. Yeah, and that's the limitation of a process also yeah. that you don't talk about. So whatever may be happening, say, in Love Jihad legislation mm -hmm. or in Assam or in CA protests or yeah. in CA legislation, the undercurrent is understood. But the, legally, the deal with it is through um, a certain doctrine. I mean, that's the limitation of the judicial process. Maybe what we can do as members of constitutional doctrine allows a test of intention in administrative action, but not in legislative action. Partly because you cannot decide what the intention of legislature is. You do not attribute, that's a legal doctrine. You do not attribute malafide to the legislature, partly because so many of them sat beside it. And that's okay. Okay. For administrative no, right? For the administrative act, that is not the law, partly because you don't have collegiate decision making necessarily. Uh, and in any case, it's easier to decipher the legislation, uh, the, the intention as a matter of evidentiary ease, because mm -hmm. there'll be file notings. You will know why certain things have happened. And if there is no reason, then you'll strike it down on the ground of absence of reasons. So, right? So if you have some reasons, they can be tested, mm -hmm. and intention can be tested. If there are no reasons, it can be struck down on the ground that there are no reasons. Legislative action is different in both senses. So a legislature is not supposed to give any reasons for enacting a law. You may not have parliamentary debate at all in a law. It may come as an ordinance and then it's passed by a voice vote. Equally, you can't then decipher as an evidentiary matter what the intention is. And in any case, in separation of powers, 
legislature. Sorry. Can I ask one question? Because people use intentionalism as an interpretive tool for statutory interpretation. That is trying to decipher what the intention of parliament was as to the meaning of a particular provision, not what motivated them to do it and then test that intention yeah. as justified or unjustified. Right? First, it's equally no. There are two consequences that follow. One is that the once you decipher what the intention is, it is the obligation of the court to enforce that intention. In Article 14, anti discrimination analysis, you say that is the intention. However, that is not a permissible intention, and therefore we strike down the act. That is a separate test, and that they cannot do. Former, in terms of intention, is deciphering the original intent from the constitution or what is the meaning of a particular phrase, and then stop. You can't say that is a valid or an invalid, allowed or a disallowed mm -hmm. intention. That's so that that is out of bounds of the courts. I have to just help you. One of the distinctions we are looking at, I think, is that when we are talking about the tests by mm -hmm. which one uh, assesses a legislation and talks about the intention of the legislature, we are looking at the object of the legislation as evidenced in the words of the legislation. Correct. So you don't have to do any mind reading. But I think where Bastian is coming from is that people have been talking about the idea of evidence regarding intention outside of the law. I think where the disagreement lies is can that evidence be looked at? Is it no, worth looking at? Very valuable. I think what you're saying, Bastian, is correct that as citizens, we must judge the intention of parliament when it makes a particular legislation. But the role is that of a citizen and your voting or your actions as a citizen where your interaction with the state. Courts haven't had limited jurisdiction, and we can't always go to courts for yeah. remedying of laws, right? Uh, at some point, they have to step back because if we start allowing courts to decide whether some intentions are valid and some are not, we can't start creating such a super majoritarian institution where the intentions can be second guessed. Uh, up. I mean, I understand how it works. I'm just because what if it's wrong? Okay, one could change it. Now, what was wrong with it, what the intention is, and then you strike down the law, and that was never the intention. So, you, these are things that courts should keep their hands off, and it's, it's good. Right. Our courts don't keep hands off anything. <laughs> if, it's, if it's good off, it's off certain things, hey, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, the issue had, yes, you I would like to intervene something. But yes. uh, how do you look at the social movement? Because when we look that when you are talking about intention, uh, most of the time, for example, you can check the LGBTQ rights that has been long time. There is past there is social movements come in. Then does there is some kind of relation between the judgment and these social movements? Sometimes does there is social movements first come and the petitions are filed through the PIL and all this. Mm -hmm. So do you think also there is a matter of these social movements and the judgment and other things? Or as the expulsion of this law and all these things? I would like to I think there is a certain kind of a symbiotic relationship between social movements. And, and I'll speak from the context of the LGBT world. Yeah. There are people who are far more aware of other forms of discrimination. I will not even venture into a full study. Uh, in terms of the LGBT movement, I think was a case of really the courts leading the social movement. And then it being reversed. So you saw an instance of both. So when the NAS Foundation judgment came in 2009, there wasn't a cohesive social movement uh, for the LGBTQ community, because you would declare yourself as criminals when you're said. So that was an, uh, an argument earlier made, saying that uh, you're outing yourself by, as a foreigner. You're, uh, and then, then that was your argument, Rupali, that you didn't want to say I'm a foreigner because you are saying that you're inviting state attention to yourself. The same thing was the case with the LGBT community. Given Section 377 and, and sector of criminalization, there was no social movement around. And then comes an hour's judgment, strikes down 377 in 2009, gives birth to a social movement. Right? People then came out. Uh, so when in 2013, the cautious judgment came and Nas was reversed and homosexuality was recriminalized, they had had a period of four years where a social movement had been generated already. It came into existence. And that then pushed and changed minds hearts of uh, not only the community at large, but also possibly of the judges. Uh, that which was a shocker in 2013 became almost inevitable in 2018. So that then happened in 2018, that the social movement had an impact 
where the judges ruled unanimously in a particular way, where the government, which was so strikingly opposed as it is now to marriage equality in 2018 said, no, you please decide the way you want. So that the best test to see whether social movement is having an impact is on the attitude of the, of the uh, government in court. So we saw that impact had happened in 2018. Now we're seeing another change in 2023, five years. It seems to be a five year thing every time. Huh? In 2023, we have uh, the marriage equality yeah. case where we are hoping now as petitioners that even though society is not necessarily in favor of marriage equality, maybe the courts will rule. Once the courts rule in a particular way, we will use that with the moral authority of the courts to change society. So, you know, this is a chicken and egg situation. But more than that, it's actually real quality, I think. Okay, I think we are uh, not running out, but I guess we can have Rupali, Ganesh, Kala, Mr. Babu, if you would like. No, I, <laughs> you could give us a little bit of how, as somebody who has been working in politics but not in law, how did you see this coming out? But if you'd like only, um, Rupali, please. I just want to keep on bastionizing and saying maybe we shouldn't abandon Malafi Day as an argument entirely. Now we don't deploy it at all. And I, even when we're discussing, we kind of don't think of it as a serious argument to make because we think it will put us on the back foot in court and because it's very difficult to prove as well. But there are sort of two points. One is that outside court, we shouldn't feel the same, same kind of restraint and someone needs to call it as it is in some space. But also inside court, can we reframe the Malafide argument in some way that makes it sound more doctrinally valid. Uh, but it's essentially about trying to demonstrate a sequence of events that happen that cast some kind of intention uh, that is discriminatory. Uh, I don't think Malafide as a doctrine will do the work right now, but if we recast it in some way, it may, it may be able to. Ganesh, how have you found this uh, discussion from the context of, let's say, political studies? Do you feel as if, um, as lawyers, we are doing something that's uh, making any difference? Is it going to, <laughs> going to get anywhere? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> of course, it is making a uh, difference. And particularly, if I will uh, say from the political science uh, perspective, and also uh, it will be seems like a kind of abstract. Uh, when we are talking about the public and private discrimination, I was thinking like that when we are talking about the very idea of public private, when Tala uh, was saying that when the government is uh, going and observing what somebody is eating, what somebody is wearing, this, this kind of private, we, we used to say this is a private uh, sphere, but nowadays this is not long, no longer being private. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it as a biopolitics system. Where, a uh, uh, philosopher like Marcel Foucault, we used to study and call it in biopolitics. But state and private and all these kind of things become very uh, great, actually. We cannot separate the, all these things. That I observe one thing that will be more helpful and we can see from this legal perspective. And after uh, this uh, discussion, I also remember uh, G.F.J. Agamben. Mm -hmm. uh, who actually saying about this bare life and other things when you are talking about the non citizens? So, does this non citizens and other things, whatever uh, we are talking here about the legal uh, recognition? So, does the legal, legal recognition has capacities to provide the sense of belongingness that we need to think? Uh, so, to have the need to just provide uh, legal recognition to some communities and some peoples. So does it really make sense of the belongingness among the others, which is very necessary uh, things that we need to rethink upon this, actually the very idea of belongingness. Uh, unless it cannot make sense because whatever we are doing in the legal sense and other things also, that we need to bring some aspect on this also. So uh, I can propose that how law can also, you can conduct some survey and study on these kind of aspects. Uh, and third point, I would like to say on the very idea of discrimination. Uh, sometimes I personally also look to the idea of discrimination as a very relational factor. Uh, some, some, uh, when, uh, the, the, there is a meaning part uh, uh, in the, the meaning of discrimination. We can see from the positive meaning of the discrimination is judgment. Itself. So in everywhere, we can see the judgment. Judgment, it may be in a positive and negative way. But First, we need to think upon the uh, in our everyday sphere that how can we 
this mental this discrimination and all these things in your question also you have read how can we eradicate the caste or uh, what you have sent in email so i think that there is a concept given by professor satish delpande who is working on upon this uh, he is calling it as an elsewhereism elsewhere elsewhereism uh, it means he is working on this it's not also in any book or any dictionary uh, according to him. yeah he is saying that uh, this attitude the attitude of uh, discrimination is very much important like uh, if you will go to anywhere and ask to anybody uh, everybody will say that no 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 i cannot do discriminate but it may be happening somewhere else yeah. uh, that's attitude we can find everywhere so i think we should have to uh, rethink and we uh, consideration upon this kind of mentality therefore i am saying this is the kind of emotional attachment that we need to also bring with the law uh, scholars like like legal philosophers martha nisla was working on yeah. all these things he was working on the resentment and all these things how the civic remorse is sufficient to provide a kind of uh, fraternity that uh, alok was uh, read yes. so and most of these scholars also on another scholars that like i can quote like b gita who is saying that no there is not sufficient that the uh, civic remorse is not sufficient to get into the justice uh, of course justice is a very abstract concept uh, and we can say that law is very fact and evidence all these things but what happens is the evidence most of the times those who are coming from the marginal backgrounds they are unable to gather the evidence also we need to work on and also looking upon this kind of aspect that what uh, i can say from my side thank, thank you and uh, tanav we should like to uh, i mean we have so i mean i think one of the topics that is a burning topic and you know been adverted to is the uniforms and reform yeah so on that i just want to you know draw from uh, Point about fraternity that you know, we refer to. Um, the idea being that everybody should have equal rights, but not necessarily under the same legislation. I think that that may be a better way to look at it. Um, but unfortunately, that no may not get the requisite political mileage. That's the that's the thing. So, I mean, of course, everybody should have the common same set of rights. Yeah, what that means in yeah. the context. Yeah, that's the fraternity. I think in that UCC question, what's happened is that uh, that Article Thirteen question has kind of prevented uh, courts from coming out with some proper explanation because there could very well be an explanation from religious freedoms yeah. about why personal laws uh, can exist, whether in a voluntary. No, it's not that the courts have not done so. The courts have done so. I mean, if you look at uh, the judgment of Daniel Latifi, they've tried to interpret yeah. that in a way that you don't want to keep the same kind of benefit that yes. the widow gets. So they say within this framework, we will give you exactly what is being given to the other than the their respective set of laws, mm -hmm. which is which is fair. Mm -hmm. But and also you have to again go back to understand that you know under a certain set of personal laws, <laughs> if you choose to be under that set of personal laws, then you may have to face whatever it comes with. If you don't like it, you know there is a secular option that may be available to you. You exercise that mm -hmm. option. So I mean, in that sense, I look at you know um, uh, the Special Marriage Act, for example, as a good exit for anybody not wanting to apply either the Hindu personal law yeah. because you know the the equality of daughters is just recent amendment. Yeah. Right? Before that, it wasn't there. So whoever you know wanted to give equality to that, give equality to their daughters in terms of inheritance, so that later on the dispute doesn't arise, they could have resorted to Special Marriage Act. And I have you know clients. Muslim clients wanting to do that kind of thing, and they they resort to the special marriage act where they can get that. So um, um, that exit option is available for those who want to exercise, and within the framework, you you give them the same rights. You recognize the same rights. Thank you, uh, Mr. Babu. Would you? Huh? <laughs> it was so nice to reflect today. Yeah. Have to know how. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Uh, friend of mine who is a famous anthropologist, he said. You ask a Hindu what is Hindu is not. He said he would give you Upanishadic definitions, equality and allow high principles. He would go home and practice shastras. Then you do a caste analysis and all that. But then you name the anthropologist. And he told me first and so I can give you Professor yeah. Arishkare, his name. So similarly, in these debates, what we do, we take the principles to a high level. No caste discrimination, no caste preference. You know, 
several people going around this table mentioned uh, today that we can keep our differences, but uh, reduce discrimination. That's uh, one of the uh, important points that I can take away from me. But on the issue of uh, intentionality, mm -hmm. already, probably that's not an area where I want to go because so the same is how ban can be justified as a pro Muslim woman move to help Muslim women to become much more empowered. Well, how are you going to question that? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it has to be in relation to the constitutional rules. Even if my intention is right, if it is not in accordance with the provisions of the constitution, I could must step it off. So intention probably is not a good yet. Again, it's a full time um, So I guess this is uh, this is it. Uh, that's the we've come to the end of the line. Uh, if anybody would like to say something now, this is the chance. There's something that you should put a hold your teeth. But yes, uh, thank you so much, everybody. I think Shukanji was away because of an emergency, so didn't get back. He wanted to discuss the CAA particularly in the context of the likely uh, use of the regional classification test in that context. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Thank you even to those who are not here and have to leave early. There is a recording, maybe they will hear me. Uh, I'm in any case. Uh, but yes, thank you. Each one of you individually, I learned what each one of you had to say. And I think um, I, I really got out of this conversation what I was hoping for. Uh, and I hope that this conversation provides everyone with, with uh, some understanding of what we want to get across. That we have to be speaking to each other about this. Uh, the head will not know what the hand is going through unless we are doing this. Um, so going forward, maybe we can try and uh, continue this sort of work. And it will be my aim. Uh, Rahul, for instance, had the suggestion that we should try and make some kind of a group or association, at the very least, to exchange information, or if not, provide research assistance in certain uh, situations. But um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience, and um, I guess that's a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.